Some brands offer you low finance or cash back or servicing. Renault don't do ors. We do ands. The Renault Kajar with 1.91% APR and €1,000 cashback and three years servicing, saving you thousands. Renault, the brand with the ands. Visit your local Renault dealer. Finance is made under a higher purchase agreement. Terms and conditions apply. Deposit required. Subject to lending criteria. See Renault.ie. If you love Star Wars and love the excitement of chasing your favorite Star Wars collectibles, the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting app from Tops is for you. Download the free app from iTunes or Google Play and collect your favorite images from the classic 1977 Star Wars cards to the Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, The Force Awakens, and much more. Collect and trade with friends new and old through the Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting app from Tops. These are the cards you're looking for. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are. With Dan Z and Corey Club, the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> yes. For an entire generation, people have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. This is the podcast you're looking for. We've been waiting for you. The force is strong here. Even stronger than the coffee. At last! Where have you been? Welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. Here are your hosts, Dan Z and Corey Club. Hello to our CWK family and welcome to show number 57 of Coffee with Kenobi. We are a Star Wars podcast that analyzes our favorite saga in a whole new way. I'm Dan Z and with me is my good friend and co-host, Corey Club. Hello to all of you and thank you for joining us. A special shout out to Dennis Keithley, Walt Fishon, Bradley W. Hall, Angela Saus, Mediocre Jedi, Adam Leonard, Christopher Ripley, Sora Slee, Jared Cantor, BJ Smith, Eric Strothers, Nick Deco, Aaron Harris, Mark Suter, Jesse, and Mike Audette for their contributions to our Coffee with Kenobi Patreon page. Thanks to each of you for your generosity to our show and for helping us provide a place where so many people are able to share their unique voice in Star Wars fandom. There are so many amazing perks and opportunities for being a Patreon contributor to Coffee with Kenobi, including CWK t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even being on a Coffee Chat podcast of your very own. It's completely your show. You create the topic and the questions, and you host the show with us all as we chat about Star Wars over a cup of coffee. Check out our webpage or the show notes for more information. You'll see other amazing opportunities as well, including even bigger ways to be part of the Coffee with Kenobi family that you won't believe. In today's show, James Floyd joins us as we discuss our topic for show number 57, Bloodline and Life Debt. We also look at the Rogue One trailer in detail and learn about the premiere of Season 3 of Star Wars Rebels. San Diego Comic Con special correspondents Mike Audette and Meteor Jedi brief us on their experiences at the annual event. Mike also shares his interview with Chuck Wendig. Nick Deco returns to once again share his thoughts on the Star Wars video games. In Collector News, we discuss the upcoming Rancho Obi-Wan Gala and talk about unique collectibles we found on our shopping adventures. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite Star Wars coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. And now, let's see what's brewing in the Star Wars universe this week. Oh, wait, this is interesting. You found something. I'm about to let everyone in on the secret. For our first news story, of course, everyone's probably seen it by now. The new Rogue One trailer, officially, from Star Wars, uh, debuted Thursday night during the Olympic Games, Summer Games, uh, in Rio. Um, I think it doesn't necessarily get to watch it live, um, but I did hop online later afterwards and avoided uh, the social media kind of like, you know, a football player would avoid getting tackled. So um, in my feed, there were a lot of folks talking about it. So I kind of shut that off and uh, was able to set aside, you know, some, some time and put on the headphones and kind of get in that groove. It's kind of been my go-to format of watching it uh, for me. Dan, how about you? Yeah, we were at back to school night and I knew it was on. Or I knew it was going to be on. So I had taped the Olympics and it, Please pardon. Uh, we have a new kitty. If any of you can hear the meowing, <laughs> so reverberating Ewok, through right? the sound of your speakers and your earbuds, <laughs> so we apologize for that. But we were we were at back to school night, and I taped the Olympics because I knew it was going to air. 
And then when we got home, it still hadn't aired, but we had a lot of stuff going on to kind of get ready for the next day. It was the first day of school. So lots going on. And I knew it was on. I knew it was out there. And you graciously texted me and said, don't go on social media because it's everywhere. And that was a good tip. Mm, and, I, yeah. and I certainly wasn't going to do that anyway, but it was just good to be reinforced by my co-host. And finally, everybody was in bed. And I watched the Michael Phelps thing. Oh, yeah. And and then I and I because I was almost like putting off the gratification because I was you know it's not often you get to see a, a new Star Wars trailer for the first time, so I watched it. I watched it three times now, twice on TV, kind of quietly in my room because I didn't want to or in our living room because I didn't want to wake anyone up. And then before this recording, I put on the headphones and I could hear things a lot clearer. Mm. And okay, one to ten, just initial. Oh yeah, tell me how you feel about it. One to ten, man. It's definitely better than the previous teaser trailer we saw uh, a couple, couple months back. One to ten, I would say. Man, I'm so good, bad at this type of stuff. I'm gonna give it a, a solid nine, um, only because it's it really amped up the ante for me. The music was really big. The characters were really kind of full full of life. Uh, a lot of different action scenes. Uh, it wasn't your typical Star Wars trailer, really, uh, to, to me. Uh, it wasn't necessarily, you know, being guided by some kind of specific um, uh, story, I guess. Like, I, I want to say a, a Skywalker story, you know. Uh, we're kind of waiting to, to hear what's going to happen next type of thing. But this is kind of a – something that seemed, seemed fresh to me um, off the bat. Oh, wow, that's exciting. That's A nine is very good. I have, I would say, an eight. I'd go between a seven or an eight. Okay. And I always, we've talked about this before, but the first time I typically see this kind of thing, Star Wars is one of those things that's so familiar. And when you see something, something Star Wars that isn't familiar, kind of throws fans for a loop on occasion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, hmm, let's just get, let's just break down into it. Just sort of, we can name things that stood out to us. Yeah, let's name some things just, we liked. Yeah, just uh, what about you? Before we do that, though, just overall, give me some specifics about you know if you had to say to someone in like a minute or two hmm. what happened in the trailer what's this movie about what would you tell them what's it about i would say it's it's specifically full of action there's a band of rebels looking to um take them take on a mission uh and you know they could sound like they have to gather you know forces to be able to carry out the secret mission and and they're not sure how it's going to go they're, they're fighting an empire so it's it's a few against many um, it, it's definitely interesting because we get to see different points of reference from different characters, or come maybe the, some of them come from some of the background. Um, and if you're a Star Wars fan, I mean, obviously you can kind of see the, the time time placement where it would fit into the pre A New Hope era. Um, you know, things are kind of dirty still. Uh, people are kind of, you know, we still see like you know mistreated people and, and the Empire really at a strong force. Uh, you know, the characters too, they seem like they're kind of unsure of themselves a little bit taking this mission on, but uh, definitely a lot of action, a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, for me, I would say I saw Anthony Bresnikan tweeted about this, but there's a lot of David and Goliath stuff here. Hmm. The big versus the little and the little becoming more mighty. And I think if you had just seen The Force Awakens and Star Wars a little rust in your brain, you might be saying. <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah. Right? I mean, I clearly they were building a Death Star because they've got that beautiful image of the dish being inserted into the top. Mm -hmm. uh, but if someone were to ask me what's this movie about, I think it might be a little challenging. But that's sort of the beauty and the power of Lucasfilm, isn't it? They have a product that is so – I mean, think about this, Corey. They're so strong and so well-known in popular culture for almost 40 years they can just put like some beautiful imagery and some action. And I guess a lot of trailers are really like that to this point. I would say that's probably fair to say. Um, but there's clearly – the Empire is clearly fearsome. It's clearly mm -hmm. overwhelmingly intimidating. And a lot of that was so stunning to me. So we, we may as well just get into the specifics. Let's see like we did before for the the – the pre-teaser or the teaser trailer. Yeah. We'll just try to come up with five things each, and I haven't written anything down, so this is just going to be <laughs> purely off memory, but let's go with, um, not necessarily in any order, 
but I know what my last one's going to be. But I know what your last one's going to be too. But I'm sure you do. I'm sure everyone does. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start off. I'll start off with a big yeah. one. One that kind of really struck me. Maybe it's not like I said. It's no particular order. Um, Donnie Yen's character, um, Churet Emwe, I think it's pronounced. Um, sure. And uh, you know, like these names are kind of still kind of finding their way uh, on my tongue in a sense. And, and of course, they're kind of new characters. We get to know a little bit more about them. But there's a scene where he. He's fighting off some stormtroopers. Um, with, a, with a like I said, with his his stick alone and, and beaming just uh, he he look he, he's blind. He can't see. So it reminded me a lot of like Daredevil, Marvel's Daredevil a little bit. But he's trusting. It sounds like he's trusting the Force. Uh, he's not a Force user uh, specifically, but he sounds like he's trusting or he, he he's beholden to the the Force and the line he says. I don't know remember it for Vadim, but uh, something of the fact that the war, the Force will will it. Um, it's pretty interesting. His character seems really. Um, really unique to me I, I don't know it just seems like someone who knows of the force but doesn't use it similar to Maz Kanata it's interesting to see these characters kind of come up through the saga itself and they know of the force and, and they don't necessarily use it but uh, they do follow it interesting for me my number one thing that stands out is that that second image of that ginor- ginormous rock with the Star Destroyer above it. Mm. That was just, the visuals in this entire thing are, are absolutely yeah. gorgeous, absolutely stunning. Clearly, we have an artist working here. And not that there weren't artists in the other Star Wars films. <laughs> of course there were. But this is just a um, visual splendor. And when I was watching it the first time, I thought, man, Corey's got to think this is completely yeah. beautiful, beyond words. I just thought, anytime they showed the ships and the fighters, and particularly the Star Destroyer, that opening sequence... And the kind of desert look to the background. It's ever since Rebels, the animated series Rebels, whenever you see these fighters that we've known for so long on the surface of a planet, I don't know, I just, I thought it was beautiful, absolutely stunning. Yeah, and to kind of piggy, piggyback off that, I mean, I would say, like I said, the visuals were stunning to me. It was kind of my thing that stood out to me. Uh, like I said, those long sweeping shots, the the, the huge shots of the, you know, looks like a, a some kind of city, that opening shot there. Uh, we see some big shots of um, that new planet, Scarif, the beach planet. Um, it, just, it just looks beautiful. I mean, the visuals are just amazing. I think they really took their time to be able to get everything right, uh, make everything look good, and, and give us something new to kind of see in Star Wars uh, in itself. It's really pretty, pretty amazing. So is that your number two? Number two, yeah. Okay. And you know what's neat about that? Like, it feels professional. Mm-hmm. And maybe that sounds odd to say, but sometimes when you see a trailer, and you can clearly tell, oh, that's CGI. Sure. You know, this yeah. isn't. When I'm watching this, it's I don't keep score per se, but nothing stands out as CGI or not CGI. It all is so seamless and integrated so well. And clearly, of course, as I said, they're professionals. They know how to make these kind of movies. And so, yeah, I'm just sort of piggybacking on my number one. But my number two is the Death Star upside down. Yeah, that, that I weird guess shot. It's upside yeah. Down. yeah, yeah. Or it's just like some sort of unique camera angle. But I think it is. Maybe that's just how it's rotating. I, I don't really know. Hopefully, everybody that's inside the Death Star has like a lot of tape or glue on their boots. <laughs> I don't know. It, it was, I thought that was just awe inspiring. And so far, I haven't really named characters, have I? But just. The visuals on this thing, and clearly Star Wars is a visual universe anyway, but that Death Star has seen that sequence, it got a lot of pop. Yeah, it, it's it's cool to see that stuff. Like you said, the visuals and the special effects are, like you said, it's, it's, they do such a good job of, of streaming that seamlessly to kind of make it, make give you second guessing, like, is this practical effects? Is this special effects? And uh, you know, we've got such great technology to be able to do such great things, so it's, I'm glad they're exploring that too. Um, you know, my, my third thing I'll go off of was this, this new ship they seem like they get into, uh, are flying away. I think we, I think we might've seen this earlier, Dan. I, the, U, the, the U-Wing? The U-Wing. I think that's what mm-hmm. it was. I, mean, I, I don't, Yeah, it was. It, it's pretty neat. Uh, it's unique. Um, it's something new, uh, vehicle wise in the, in Star Wars. And, and you know, it's funny too, because you think you've seen everything right in Star Wars. You're like, oh, that's that. All oh, those at ats and you know, all those other things. And uh, no, it's not. It's not. All this is all kind of different technology of the time and the era and uh, it's really really kind of pretty sweet very good well my third one is actually a character and it's it's Forrest Whitaker's character of Saw Gerrera uh, yeah knowing I really like that that Andron arc anyway as we've mentioned before hmm. and 
this is more than him just saying something ominous. I mean, he does say something ominous, but you get him to see a bit of a half smile when he's talking to Jin. And there's something about the power in that man's voice and the gravitas yeah. that he exudes. And he really channeled uh, that animated character in a way that I just found amazing. So he just seems to, I, I thought I was going to be like, oh, okay, that's fine. But I feel like he suddenly has become a standout to me. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah, it's funny too because you mentioned that, and and you know earlier for the teaser trailer, characters that stood to me was was uh, Krennic, um, and he didn't necessarily send out to me this one time. I was a different character, uh, K2SO, um, voiced by Alan Tudyk, mm-hmm. uh, the the droid uh, that apparently is can candle himself, and um, yeah, he sounds like he's going to be fun, a lot fun to watch. He's he, I think he's really uniquely built. Um, it's really neat to see something again, like we haven't seen yet. This type of droid that uh, can kind of fend for himself; it doesn't have to rely on anybody else helping him out, like C three PO. It's interesting too. Pretty much the only one who can. <laughs> That's Let's true. Just be honest. I love That's the guy, true. but come on. It's cool to see this too. I mean, a lot of he's the... like Yao Ming tall. Oh, that's that's good. Yeah, he's pretty. That the thing too is like it was a performance capture suit that he wore, mm-hmm. and obviously they're you know, like I said we've talked about the special effects are amazing. This again too is like you almost can't um, you can't see that like oh wait is there somebody is that a, a practical effect is that something in a suit yeah you know it's, it's so it's so well done. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So that that was your three. Uh, right? that was number four for me. That was number four for you. Real. Oh, yeah, I guess that's right. So number four for me is one that my friend Caleb and I were talking about today at school. And it was that scene, that sequence with the ad ad, of course, and ad ads are always, oh, that's not an ad ad, it's an ad act, A-T-A-C-T, right. right? Yep. But it's, it's when Baz is shooting that, what appears to be some sort of land to the air rocket. The rocket launcher, yeah. Yeah. I don't know that we've seen a weapon like that in Star Wars, have we? I mean, it looked yeah. like huh. real world gorilla type stuff. And I thought, oh, this, this is an interesting effect. This is an interesting approach. This isn't a laser. This is a flat out propelled rocket of some sort. And I thought, oh, that just sort of, well. yeah, it's a little bit. And it's just sort of a sign that this is something very unique and something very primal and authoritative in its own sort of spin because it just it changes the stakes it makes star wars more of a reality Mm -hmm. and it's just a quick shot and obviously i haven't seen the film yet but there's just something about that i think if they carry that over i think it's going to be i'm going to use your favorite word that i say polarizing (laughs) Because I, I think people want Star Wars to be Star Wars, but no Skywalkers, although clearly mm. there is a pretty main Skywalker in it. Yeah. But but without that kind of ambiance, you know, a, a, a lot of the challenges for the prequel for some people was the fact that there was no Han Solo, right? Mm-hmm. There was no Luke Skywalker. You had Anakin, but he isn't someone that we grew up with. So do you think that this film is going to suffer from that? And I don't think they will because... Because Jin seems so powerful and just such a an on screen presence, but I don't know. That was number yeah. number four. That's good. And uh, you know, my last one I think is similar, or probably the same as your last one. But uh, the way I go into it is this: uh, like I said before, it seems like you know, if you didn't know Star Wars, you didn't necessarily were on you know the cutting edge of the news coming out and stuff. You, you could get mistaken for where this movie kind of takes place, or maybe what the movie is about. You don't necessarily you don't see lightsabers. Absolutely, you can't, you can't necessarily pick it out of a, out of a, out of anything necessarily. If you, somebody, if I'm, you know, I'm going to put in reference my wife. She was down to watch this trailer, uh, and just saying, hey, it's, this is a movie trailer. You know, uh-huh. obviously there's some music cues and things like that, but necessarily there's laser bolts. I mean, we've seen sci-fi films and such, so this feels very original in in the way they're they're doing this. this yes, necessarily couldn't call. I mean, uh, Star Wars story but it's also it's it's a sci-fi story and there's a lot more to it like you, like you mentioned before but we definitely get to see this at the, with this at the end of this trailer um the, the big reveal and it, that what kind of that's when i was watching it and that that final scene i see that and go okay yeah this this is a star wars story i mean not that i didn't wasn't taken out of that context but i was almost like I was so caught up in what was going on the action the characters getting to know each of them a little bit more 
this kind of rounded it out for me and gave me that nine effect. That nine out of ten effect was okay. Mm. We have Darth Vader. I mean, I don't know what kind of role he plays in it, but here he is, and you better be ready for him. So it's it's that that kind of that that you know somebody punched me in the shoulder. I'm not. I'm dreaming uh, feeling. Right. Well, I I think I can say we are breaking ears here on coffee with Kenobi. <laughs> The role he's going to play is he's going to be a Dark Lord of the Sith. Is that what he's going to be? Yeah, I think so. I think okay. so. Yeah. Uh, I like that you said that because if you didn't know it was, it was Star Wars, would you know? Well, I mean, as soon as I say the word Force and you see Stormtroopers. Sure, yeah, there, there's inklings. I mean, but there's, there's little, there's, that's pretty clear. Death but, Star. Yeah. But, but also if you're sort of, if you're just watching him, just look like a, a really cool, intense sci-fi action flick that you wanted to see. You know what I mean? That would have sure. just sort of his own little cult sure. following you put the Star Wars font on it and you got some of the magic. Uh, when I say my number five, I've suddenly realized that I probably could name like five or six more yeah. and maybe we should. Sure. Um, clap if you're listening if you want us to. Okay. That seems overwhelming <laughs> to me. Uh, it's Vader. The scene of it. That's the the whole time I was just, whenever I watch these things for the first time, I feel like I'm performing brain surgery. Hmm. And I sort of am in my own brain because I'm just really slicing and dicing and thinking about stuff in in different ways but as soon as vader showed up i exhaled if that makes sense i was almost like holding my breath watching it because hmm. i just you know drinking it in I, oh clearly but when vader showed up i was just like yeah like that just <laughs> adds that's like 10 exclamation points in a row which i never do in my actual writing because i think that's cheesy <laughs> but it was just very strong and, and you've got to have an anchor right mm. the yeah, the prequels good. some people didn't necessarily think had an anchor but the force awakens had an anchor it was han solo right sure this one yeah. your anchor is arguably the most popular character in cinema of all time good or bad invader and i i love so much it's just the back of his helmet with this with the red you know in the in the foreground of him the black and red is so you know, emblematic of Vader anyway, but he's such a force. He's such a presence that they don't need to show his helmet. They don't right. need to show yeah. that gleaming armor that Tom and I were talking about today. There's a name drop, Tom. There you go, buddy. <laughs> and I just think that's so amazing. Not, not often in a trailer, unless you're saving something, right, for a big reveal. Sure. It's just clever. They, everyone knows Vader's in it. They've they've made no bones about that. They've made no bones about James Earl Jones coming back, which is the fact that it's just the back of his head, and it causes that kind of weight. <laughs> That's big. I mean, that to me, that was what sold it for me. Yeah, if, if something is Star Wars, you know, you can definitely say that Darth Vader is like its mascot. Like I said, the front of the mask yeah. is definitely that yeah. mascot. But we got to see the back of his head. We still know who it is. That's how iconic this guy is. You can see the back of his head and know exactly who he is. Right. Uh, it, it's just one of those things that brings it all together for me. And it's it just, I don't know, it's its weird to think about we're getting another Star Wars film on this essence. And something, something I feel like I feel like it's a brand new story. I, I, that we, I mean, we know the storyline, right? But we also know, feel like getting something brand new it's funny as it sounds to me no, it's true it feels like original so you know some of, you know, some of the other ideas that kind of popped up for me for this was some of the other runner-up uh, honorable mention yeah honorable mention. mention sure jen urso she uh, obviously has more going on here than meets the eye i don't know fully what's going on I mean, she's, she's transformed maybe i i don't know that well, yet. more than meets the eye is transformers <laughs> oh man <laughs> oh jeez <laughs> Oh, bad pun jokes. Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's she's something going on with who she is. She's in shackles. Um, she's taking on a yeah. mission that maybe it's a little over her head. Shaking on this these group of of rogues, if you will, uh, to to join her in this mission. Um, you know, we get to meet them kind of bit by bits and pieces, and it's interesting because you know she's leading leading the drive there to t- to carry this out and. Was it something she's sentenced to do? Is it something she's asked to do? Is it something she's, you know, secretly doing? I, you know, it's so many. There's so many things up in the air about her, and, and I'm ex- curious to know what's going to happen next. Interesting. The um, Gareth Edwards clearly, mm-hmm. I mean, clearly understands how to make a film beautiful and how to drive a story and make it connected, mm-hmm. um, which you know, Zack Snyder 
may, may not be able to do in some of the DC films. Yeah, I um, heard that. You know what I'm saying, homie? But <laughs> the, the thing is, I have everything about Jen, and she's just, she's so charismatic, and she just sort of exudes charisma and charm, mm-hmm. but in sort of a dangerous way. You know what I mean? That's interesting. But the scene when she's running on that little scaffolding and the TIE fighter raises. Oh, during the day there, yeah. That's a pretty pretty awesome scene. Clearly it's thrown in there to give you that wow factor. It works. Yeah, definitely. But Star Wars has sort of a history with scaffolds, right? Empire Strikes True. Back. Yeah. Um, Force Awakens. Force Awakens. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of punctuation in that kind of thing, and it's pretty stunning. So that that would be my an honorable mention if if we're doing that sort of thing. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, the other thing I want to mention too is you're waiting for the the other part of Star Wars. To me, it's that great you know feast of Star Wars. You're getting that side plate of John Williams score, uh, and then this, this doesn't necessarily have that. It has a different feel to it, and I like oh, yeah. that. I like that. I did. I, I didn't. It didn't went bringing up. I mean, there were some cues there. Of course, of Star Wars things, but there's no, uh, you know, Skywalker themes or such. It's more of a, I don't know what, how to place it. I'm not a music connoisseur uh, like some of our friends, but uh, it, it was different to me, and I like the fact that it gave you different, a different feeling. Um, the whole film, I think, had a feeling of it being a little bit different. Uh, yeah. Everything was dirty, but yet, yet the shots were really clean, uh, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, um, well, said. so it was it, it was interesting that way, but I do like that way the way this is filmed, the way it looks, and the way it sounds. I agree. The music is something that's definitely an honorable mention, and I'm glad you reminded me of that. the 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 beautiful piano of the Imperial March that is sort of is throughout this thing. I thought that was gorgeous, and it's something. It's always fun to hear Williams's music, and he's obviously not doing the score for this one. But you're you're borrowing from the master because sure. that's what you do, that's what you have to do, and I, I just thought. I mean, obviously, I always get the soundtracks because it's Star Wars and just sort of in our fan contract, right? You, know, you get the soundtracks. But this, I thought, oh, I'm going to listen to this more than just because it's a soundtrack to Star Wars. I'm going to listen to it because it's mm. it's beautiful. I'm sort of a sucker for piano, yeah, well played piano, anyway. So I totally agree with you. Um, I'm sure there are other things we want to mention and. Feel free to do that, but I also am curious to see if there's anything in this that doesn't work for oh, you at, good this, question. at this far. I mean, feel free to point out other things that you liked. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start with one thing I, I was kind of bubbling up to talk about was uh-huh. the battles. I feel like the battles are going to be really cool. We got mm-hmm. we got rebel forces running through you know ocean and and nice and sandy beaches, and and we have death troopers you know mowing people down and. Uh, it's really cool. I think some of the battle scenes are going to be a lot of fun. We have a lot of characters. We mentioned uh, Donnie Yen's character, you know, fighting with a stick versus uh, these big, you know, troops. Uh, it's just the the like I said that that uh, David and Goliath feel to it. It's really really mm-hmm. unique, pretty cool. But I'm trying to think of maybe something that I didn't like. If you've got something, go ahead. Well, it's not necessarily that I didn't like it, but I just uh, at first blush, I'm like, sure. Hmm, I don't know if that's going to work for me. Well, let, let me ask you this. I mean, you gave it. Was seven out of ten? Is that seven or eight? Seven yeah. or eight out of ten. Why was that? What was missing out of that not being a little higher? I don't know that there's anything missing other than the fact that it, I think I'm gonna have a hard time divorcing myself from the fact that there's no heroic Skywalker in this because mm. you know. But I guess um, K2SO. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, everybody always likes the droids, right? They they <laughs> plug them in and they they sort of check that box and and God love them, right? He's that's fun, that's cool. I don't know the fact that he's so. I don't. There's just something about him that rubs me the wrong way, and that's probably what it's supposed to do. Hmm. But I remember when I first we first encountered Chopper, I was a little bit eh, about Chopper. And now, now you're getting a tattoo. He's one of my faves. That's right. Now I'm getting the tattoo. So. I don't know. I'm I'm going to hold reserve my judgment for K two S O. But he's. I mean, a lot of people have already made him a fan favorite. He's certainly not that for me. I don't know if it's because his design mm-hmm. is so almost uh, macabre and grisly looking. Hmm. But we will see. Uh, let, you know, check back with me on December fifteenth after we see this movie, and I may have done a one eighty on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I mean, it's that's the thing. I don't like him, but I but I'm not like. I'm not like you had said to me. You want to get the Black Series mm-hmm. figure of that one, and I thought, well, there's, 
I just can't imagine me doing that. But who knows? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny because I try to pull out things that are interesting to me, and it, that's one thing that's interesting to me, his, his characteristics. But like I said, maybe I won't feel that way later down the line. And, and you know, one of those things that happened, you know, for example, is um, Captain Phasma, I thought was a great character, and she was kind of mm-hmm. underused, I think, in Force Awakens, and kind of, you know, my, right. like had a different feelings after the, I saw the film. So it's it can kind of go either way, I think. I think that's fair sure. to say. Um, yeah, some of the things that I guess wouldn't make it a 10 out of 10 for me. Um, I think I, I, I have this feeling, and I, I, like I said, we, we don't like to speculate, but I have a feeling of like, we won't get a, a, a full story in a sense of, you know, we kind of, we under, understand where things are going, right? I mean, does that make sense to you? It's like, yeah. we know exactly what's going to happen. So there's, the not, there's no surprise. We know the ending. So I, I think that there, to me, it's like we're just meeting these characters for a while. And they're doing their mission or carrying on. And it seems like, wow, we're just kind of getting, we're missing something here. And, and maybe, like I said, we haven't seen the film yet. And I don't want to speculate, but I, I feel like maybe we might just, you know, feel like there's there's something misses and piece, pieces missing to the story after we walk out of theaters. I'm feeling a little bit uh, like we, there could have been more to say. Um, but wow. you know, maybe that's, that's the best part of it. So, yeah. Because yeah. then, then there's ambiguity and you can speculate. And well, the other thing too is, that with Pablo too. Really, there's the sure. It's more the ambiguity is fun, but not everyone likes that. And and yeah, mm-hmm. we these characters we don't know what their fate is. We know they're not in a new hope. So, but we don't know what's going to happen to right. them if they're kind of blend into the shadows. Or you know, it's the same thing for the characters in Rebels as well. Um, but how much story can be told about them? It's mm-hmm. it's impossible to know, isn't it? But true. I totally understand what you're talking about. I will say too. I would hope that you know. Obviously, there's novels coming out and other parts right. of media coming out to kind of eat up and, and drink up some more about characters we might like and want to learn more about. But um, I, I think that's, that's the I guess the Lucasfilm way to be able to do that too. I mean, that's I think that's a nice um, companion uh, piece to the film. Well, I, lo- I love the the uniforms the costumes yeah they just they just look so they look comfortable and breathable <laughs> right this is like suddenly become like a gap podcast <laughs> but they they just i don't know they just look very worn and like something that people would actually wear where i don't mm-hmm. know you can always say that i mean ray's costume is awesome but just you just can't picture seeing someone walk down the street wearing it you sure. know what i mean everyday appeal unless yeah. you're at a convention but for this i mean you could see someone wearing that like to go to work like to, to do some sort of hmm. in, industrial work or to just to do something that's very livable and you got to get your hands dirty and you got these these outfits that you've worn for so long and they've just become like a part of you. And I think that kind of shows you the grit of these characters and, and what's going on here. I just I mentioned it before at the top of this, but the fact that the Empire looms so powerfully and they've done a, a gorgeous job of doing that ever since hmm. the new canon has reshaped itself the empire's effect its stronghold the way that it it puts its heel on the throat of anyone who is not basically palpatine really sure or, or flying the imperial flag i think this is really going to ring it home in a in a unique way and i almost wonder where they're going to go with this era after rogue one fades away because they're really doing some uh, strong things here what, what do you think about clearly i sort of have a, an aversion to being forced to feel a certain way hmm. when I watch a movie. Like, I don't want to be manipulated. I want to be told a story and be allowed to take it where I want to take it, if that makes sense. Yeah. How do you feel about the, the chemistry that we've seen, you know, in two trailers? So it's nothing. It's a, it's a, it's a quite an insignificant sample size. But Cassie and Andor and Jen here, so hmm. I mean, clearly they, they want you, at least the, the, with the press and things like that, they want you to think that there's one of those star-crossed lovers things going on mm-hmm. what do you think about their chemistry yeah and we can talk about that i think that's fair i mean we're not we're not alluding to anything we don't know what's going to happen with them but yeah. the way the film shot the way that they're looking at each other i mean you can you can obviously see there's, there's attraction there um so maybe, maybe I, I don't know it's, it's a good question it's so like i said m beauty uh, is hard to tell of what's really going to play out, and like you mentioned too, it, it, so these characters where where will we be left after you know this this show this movie is over? Where will these characters go? And I think that's part of me kind of feels disjointed a little about that too. Is that them just mm-hmm. kind of dropping them and feeling okay? Well, we're done with them. Now we can move on. And and I feel like man, it's what are, they, what are these such rich characters already? I mean, I'm really loving some of them uh, and finding that 
you know, they're really great, and I like to know more, but I, I feels a little bit short sighted. Yeah, that I I, I agree with that. I, I don't want to. I mean, let, let's just let's just call out the um the the blue tauntaun in the room <laughs> or the purple tauntaun in the room, whatever the expression is. Um, the chemistry in you know Attack of the Clones particularly was sure was it gave a mixed reaction to people. No, no judgment here. It just it it was different. It, you know, it wasn't Bogart in Casablanca, right? It was different. Sure. So we don't want to get into a situation where we've got some weirdness. And they're good actors, they're talented people. Um, I guess I just want to, if it, it's a natural progression of the story and it makes sense, then mm. yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it. But if it's something forced to put in that check the box thing, mm, then I'm not interested in that. Now, The Force Awakens did not do that. Like you could true, argue true. That, that there's something romantic between... Finn and Ray, and Ray. Yeah, but that's not till like the very, very end. I exactly, and even at that point, it's it's very it's one sided. Argument, I most think, likely, too. you know. Yeah, exactly. It's very one sided, and Ray just has found people that care about her. That she's found her family, and she's never really had family that we have seen throughout the history of her as a character. So the fact that that was, I thought that was handled beautifully, and it may happen beautifully here too. And, and you probably can't be in these intense situations. And not, you know, have certain things go through. But, you know, I always think about what Freddie said going through my, my head. You know, there's not time for that. Hmm. There's not time for that because there's a war going on, yeah. right? Yeah. People are dying. That's that's sort of takes over. And, you know, we're making a lot of presuppositions. Sure, and we, we're right. flat out admitting that. So it's just it's just sort of a, my spider sense, if you will. <laughs> you know, I can't believe I didn't mention this because... The first thing I wrote on Twitter about this, really the only thing, because I didn't want to put too much out there before you and I talked about it, because that's sort of that's sort of how we do. But I think the X wings have never looked so sleek, and and it sounds weird to say, but they look just so sexy and <laughs> powerful and slick. You know what I mean? Like I just thought I have, I've always been like I've liked X wings, but it's not like something like where I. You know, I, I'm more of a Falcon guy. Sure. But when I saw the X-Wings in this, in these shots, like going through the rainstorm and I all of that. I don't think that's an X-Wing. Well, according to uh, Justin Bolger on StarWars.com, it is. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't necessarily see that. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's interesting because I assumed it was the, the U-Wing that, that we see primarily. But yeah. maybe I'm wrong. Like I said, I, there's a lot, of this, there's a lot to, to be seen. Well, the, the U-Wing, is, as Matt Martin said on the Star Wars show with Weird Al Yankovic, it's like a troop it's a troop transport, okay. right? And it, and it helps provide air support and cover, and it brings in a lot of soldiers here and there. But this one was firing on stormtroopers. It doesn't mean the troop transport wouldn't do that either, but that was definitely an X-Wing. Watch it. I don't know how many times I'll, you've seen I'll, it. I'll have to go watch it again. Watch it again, and you'll be like, oh. So that, that was pretty cool, too. Cool. Uh, anything else you want to say before we? Um, yeah, I mean, I will. I'll mention Krennic. Um, yeah, I, I do like the character still. I think he's cool. Um, and the full force of the Empire too. I want to mention that it was felt, obviously, like you mentioned. One thing that I didn't necessarily see was any stormtroopers getting shots off that were taking rebels down. Um, we saw a lot of rebels, or I'm mean, sorry, um, stormtroopers getting blown up and spun all over the place, but we didn't see rebels necessarily getting blasted or blown up or i mean not that i want to see a bunch of war but i mean mm-hmm. well you know, so. there, it's it does it seem like it's lopsided a little bit like you know the the, well, the underdogs you know really just taking it to them i th- i think that's by design because the empire is clearly such an overwhelming force mm-hmm. um the death star literally is looking down on the planet and with contempt you could say so interesting you have to do that i think because if you're not showing the rebels being somewhat, you know, being able to put some sort mm-hmm. of a dent in the Imperial armor, then why, if you're not a diehard Star fan, why even watch it? If you already know that they're just going to be slaughtered, sure. You know, when you get you got to clearly the Empire is powerful, and as the Emperor has foreseen, but <laughs> this you you have to do that. I think you to show that these guys are fighters. You know, they'll nip at your heels, and and they are a a danger as well to the Empire. In a way that they don't expect. Again, the David and Goliath thing. Yeah, it's good. So, if unless you can think of anything else, let's uh, love to hear what 
everyone else has to say. So write us in, send us an MP3, and it'll be interesting to revisit this conversation after we have seen Rogue One. For our second news story, we've got exciting news on Star Wars Rebels Season 3. We received the official word this week that the premiere is Saturday, September 24th. It's going to be at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and it's going to have the premiere of Grand Admiral Thawne on Rebels. Uh, it's going to be an hour premiere. And the, the title of the episode, Corey, is Steps into Shadow. What do you think, man? Uh, pretty interesting. Uh, you know, it's because we talked a lot heavily about this uh, recently when they debuted it at Star Wars uh, Celebration Europe. And, you know, it's it's cool because September 24th is my oldest son's birthday. He turns... Wow. Yeah, he turns 11, so it's it's pretty exciting because we talked about it. And um, what's neat, too, is we talked about, you know, Thrawn and uh, them introducing him to the series, and he's officially canon now. And, you know, to my son, it, it's it's a brand new character in his world. Um, he doesn't know oh, anything true. about him. So it's, it's kind of cool to see it that way. You know, I know kind of going in, my kind of preconceived notions of what it may be or what it, what it may not be. But, you know, of course, it's going to be a brand new Thrawn because this is now officially canon, and I'm sure that... You know, some some similarities will kind of back and forth. I think that that's kind of kind of cool too. I, it's nice to see uh, them kind of use Legends characters uh, and kind of bring them out of the depths and, and see them. I mean, in a new light. So it'd be interesting to see. Of course, uh, the tremendous uh, season finale from season two, uh, catching up with all our favorite Rebels characters and seeing where they're kind of headed next. Um, I'm sure. very excited. I agree, and thank you for stating it the way you did, because I've been hearing a a lot of people saying, well, you know, Thrawn is canon again. Mm. No, no, actually, he's not canon again. He's canon for the first time. The Expanded Universe Legends line was never canon. It was always fun and always awesome, but it's never been canon. And Soapbox done. Sorry, (laughs) I just couldn't help it, because that's why it's so exciting to me. He is... He's obviously existed in, in in Legends. That's the reason why the Star Wars mythology is so powerful. Because I've, I've used this example before, but King Arthur is an, an excellent mirror to this. Because there are a lot of different authors who told King Arthur's stories. And sometimes they went together and sometimes they didn't. So that's why Star Wars seems to fit so nicely. We're going to have Grand Admiral Thrawn. Thrawn. And it's cool that you mentioned that because your kids and a lot of people are going to be introduced to Thrawn for the first time. And I sort of took that for granted because I'm so familiar with Heir to the Empire and, and the Zahn trilogy. But a lot of people aren't. So it's very possible, if not plausible, that Thrawn will be exposed to even more people than he ever has been. Well, like you mentioned, too, it's going to kind of have mixed results, I think, once the episode's over and we kind of get to see him. Uh, the other thing is interesting too to, to think about. You know, we've only read them on the page, um, and a, a lot of that has to do with obviously the, the spectacular Legends series that he's in, and also you know we don't see him you know, on the screen kind of in full motion. We see to see his uh, expressions and such, and in a different way. We it's a different kind of medium. So to kind of take it in that capacity as well, it's it's brand new for us to kind of see how he's going to be. But you know, it, like I mentioned too, I'm excited to see where you know the crew of the ghosts are going to be headed next. Um, you know, and, and maybe pick up where, you know, see where Soka is. I, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. I, I mean, kind of was kind of left up in the air. We don't know what she's going on to do, but it seems like they're going in a new direction. Uh, again, you know, Kanan's blinded. Uh, there, there's so many things going on. I mean, we, we saw from the trailer itself, Ezra's headed in a new direction. Darth Maul's kind of engaging here and there. So uh, it's very exciting um, on where we're going to see what, and see what happens. But uh, definitely we're always, you know, almost a month away. For our next news story, we had special correspondents and members of the Coffee with Kenobi family, Mediocre Jedi and Mike Audette, uh, got to feature an uh, interview with Chuck Windig from San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, it was wonderful for them to be able to do that for us. I'm uh, so glad that we can kind of reach out to those guys and, and be able to have them cover this for us. And, of course, uh, you know, what a great thrill, thrill for them to be able to experience that and, and have a good time. So here it is. Greetings. This is MJ. Mike and I attended San Diego Comic Con 2016 from July 20th through the 24th on behalf of Copy with Kenobi. We attended all the Star Wars panels that we could, interacted with the Star Wars exhibitors and the Lucasfilm employees, and in general tried to soak up as much Star Wars as possible. So, MJ, what was your favorite booth that you were able to attend at uh, Comic Con? You, you know, I, I, it's probably fair to say that the entire Lucasfilm Pavilion. In general, I, I love the big Masasi temple that they had. 
Um, obviously, you and I know that you already you already know that that we spent a lot of time at the uh, um, the the Del the publishers Del Rey Star Wars and uh, and DK and uh, really enjoyed that. Um, I, I think probably probably Del Rey. How about you? Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to say probably the Del Rey, the publishers area. Um, it was just like a lot of happenings going around there every single day. There was author signings, uh, giveaways, events. It was it was sort of like the place to be for the you know the Star Wars crowd that was there. Absolutely, uh, the location was perfect as far as people coming and going. And since we were right next to the Rogue One costumes, we had a, a steady stream of Star Wars fans going by. So that was really fun. Definitely. How about your favorite panel or event? Um, probably the favorite panel was uh, I had a, probably the uh, the Star Wars publishing panel. The Hasbro one was really good too because there's a lot of cool stuff coming. But the publishing was really cool because I like I'm just a fan of the books and the comics, and it's cool to see you know what sort of is coming on the horizon with everything that they're working together with with Marvel and Del Rey it's in the story group it's whole concise uh storytelling so it's really cool I, I completely agree I, I think um the the four Star Wars panels that were going on were basically back to back on Friday morning and one of the fun things was getting there early with you and uh and and Jonah Marie and we saw Brian Sims and and, and Mag uh, Mag Mays, Margaret and just hanging out with folks, and then a geek girl diva came along and sitting up in front and soaking it all in. I love the publishing. There was a lot of crowd excitement about the toys. Um, I had no shame in getting down in front and taking photos like right in front of the Hasbro people. But it didn't <laughs> yeah. matter how good my photos were, and they weren't great. You know, using my iPhone because uh, Justin Bulger from Lucasfilm was sitting off to the side, and it. It, it, as soon yeah. as I took a photo, he's, you know, got the high res Hasbro photo and he's posting it. So, hey, you do what you can. That's true. He's got the inside track. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so what um, overall were you most excited to see at the uh, weekend for Comic-Con? That's a tough call. I, I, I think I didn't expect any more Rogue One or Rebel stuff since obviously Celebration had just happened. Um, I was really excited uh, for books and toys. Um, besides the overall con experience, uh, I like cosplay. I like seeing fans. I love seeing joy on fans' faces. I like kids of all ages doing their thing. But uh, the books and the toys, the publishing and the stuff from Hasbro, even though I'm not a huge toy collector, I, I appreciate them for the, appreciate them for the art that they are. And from when I was a, a tiny little guy playing with my brother's toys um, when I was wasn't even able to talk yet and all the all the the cool figures that we used to play in the backyard swamps and everything um i also love really being able to see the the obi-wan kenobi con exclusive and loved 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 seeing the six inch black series sabine Hera, and and the new qui-gon they were pretty cool how about you yeah those were awesome um mine was probably to see the rogue one costumes uh, after they were debuted at uh, Celebration and then they announced that they were going to be bringing them to Comic-Con too, I was like, okay, I definitely want to go see those. And then I think it might have been just like the day before they – or that Thursday when it opened, they announced that they had the new character two tubes. So it was like – I mean there's there's our Comic-Con exclusive right there was we got to see the brand new character. How about as far as costumes go? Obviously, you talked about the Rogue One costumes. I'm sure there were some some cosplayers there taking copious notes and taking photos. Um, what costumes did you see people wearing that you really enjoyed? Um, there was so many rays. It was in, it was oh, yeah. absolutely insane how many ray costumes there were. But probably the my favorite one I saw was that uh, Jedi Temple Guard that we saw. That thing was awesome. He had the the mask that moved and the the double bladed, you know, mm -hmm. the the saber staff that they have. That was really awesome. Now there was a I saw a, a couple. Um, actually, I'm not sure they were a couple. I saw a man and a woman uh, who appeared to be a couple, and they were both Jedi Temple guards. Did I'm not sure if I saw someone with a mask that moved. Maybe we saw different people. Oh yeah, I might have seen a different one when I was walking around one of the days. Okay. Yeah. I do remember that couple that you were talking about, too, though. 
Yeah, it took them a while to get all suited up and everything and to get their masks on and get their hoods just right. And I felt kind of bad at one point. I asked for a photo and it looked like it was a big production. I was like, you know, if, if you got some place to be, because they were getting stopped every five feet and I felt yeah. sorry for them. But, you know, like they could have said no, I suppose. Yeah, I have a, th- I have a feeling I know what uh, what costume cosplay might have been your favorite for her. There was a uh, certain amount of Ahsoka's running around. Oh man, it's it's like it's like you read my mind, Mike. It might be the <laughs> Jedi mind trick or something. But um yeah, it's no secret that I'm an Ahsoka fan and there were lots of Ahsokas. You're right though, seeing that number of, of rays of all ages was really cool. I actually got a photo with one of the tiny little ones. Um since I was wearing my Jedi costume on Saturday, I got a photo with the one and her mom actually had to ask her to put down the juice box for the photo. And she was wearing <laughs> yeah. a tiny little play, a little pair of uh, Chuck Taylor uh, um, black Converse. And it was totally cute. But the two Ahsokas that I really liked the most, there was the the Yarn Soka by Candace Miller. Uh, it took her, it was entirely crocheted, headpiece, lightsabers and all. And it took her four months to make. And, and I really liked the steampunk Ahsoka by Poppy Applegate. Um, her, her, instead of traditional Togrut and Montreals and Leku, she was wearing a wig that was basically dyed blue and white. And it was, it was really neat. So I, I know if people are interested in those, uh, I, I've got, um, um, I took some photos and, and they're available on uh, Coffee with Kenobi's photo stream on Twitter. Yeah, those, those costumes were just the the incredible amount of detail that they're able to put into it and it's it's pretty awe inspiring sometimes absolutely so, is especially with the ahsokas because they have to you know they have to do the body painting as well exactly you got to get the skin tone to match the the reddish orange hue so um i think we're probably you know just about to get close to wrapping up our sort of little comic con recap so lastly, what do you think was your favorite overall moment of the convention? That is a tough one. Um, it's, it's also no uh, secret that uh, I really enjoy um, taking my son to these events and introducing him to the, the big world of Star Wars. So on, on, on Sunday, um, uh, I was not wearing my Jedi costume, but on Sunday, having seen everything I needed to see on the floor, my son is four and a half, dear listeners, and he is uh, a highly energetic child, and I did not want to expose him to too much. I wanted to be able to leave immediately if things got to be too much, um, but he was just a super awesome kid, and uh, we took his – he was wearing his Coffee with Kenobi t-shirt, um, plus points. It was orange. So uh, it was really easy to see him on the con floor. And uh, we also had his uh, little Jedi robe, and he had a great time. And, and um, he actually corrected me at one point. I actually I accidentally called a Darth Maul uh, um, Kylo Ren. And, yeah, he he's, hasn't let me forget about that. So he's learning well. But uh, <laughs> that and uh, that was my first uh, all-out cosplay. Uh, I'm going to be uh, blogging about that very soon. But those are that was probably my favorite stuff, sharing it with my son. How about you? Yeah, for me, uh, it was probably just being able to catch up with friends, honestly. Like, seeing everything that's there is cool and, you know, all the things that, you know, you can buy and, you know, the whole hubbub around everything. But, like, just for me personally, it's just being able to hang out with friends, reconnect with people you've maybe not seen in a long time. You know, you're sort of just there to celebrate what we love of, of star wars and everything else entertainment and geek culture and it's just like it's sort of just a party where you can get together and hang out and have fun and do crazy things like when we were at the delray booth and just handing out mm-hmm. posters and yelling at people to come get some books and uh you know erish was doing crazy things so this was like everything that just was able to happen as far as that was probably just my favorite part of the uh, convention. You know, I, I got to also say that one of the, the things that keeps coming back from Celebration Anaheim was how much fun everyone had um, off the con floor, like say in the Hilton bar, and just hanging out. And although I'm not a huge drinker, I'm not trying to glorify the uh, alcohol, but I think everyone was having a good time just sharing the experiences, just like you said. And, and we definitely got a little bit of that at the, uh, at uh, San Diego Comic-Con as well. 
just all around good people and um, seeing folks again. But of course, you know, when you see him almost every day on Twitter, it's almost like you, you know him, even if you've never met him before. It's it's a really great thing about the world that we have today. Definitely, yeah. It just it just makes me want it to be um, next April in Orlando so much more. Absolutely. All right. So sounds like that's um, everything over from Comic Con. So on behalf of MJ, I'm Mike. Back to Corey and Dan. Let me introduce myself first. Yeah. I am Mike from Coffee with Kenobi. I'm here with Aftermath and Life Dead author Chuck Wendig. Hello. So we're going to ask him a few questions. So, first up, you were originally only supposed to be the author of the first book in the Aftermath trilogy. Right. When, officially, yeah. Officially. When did Lucasfilm slash Del Rey approach you to complete the do the complete trilogy yourself? Uh, they got my drafts in, and we did edits and stuff on them, and I think they were pretty happy with both my work and um, the speed and the... The, uh, you know, the process, they seem to like me. And, cool. um, and pre-sales were good, so I think they, they went ahead and wanted a couple more. Okay, awesome. That's, I mean, it makes sense to have a complete one author being able to do a concise yeah. story, right. put it together, start to finish, exactly. know the, everybody ins and outs. Yeah, and when know. we were talking about the first book, we did sort of, I didn't do a full, like, trilogy plan, but yeah. we kind of leaned into it a little bit mm-hmm. to be like, well, if I stay on, this is where I would go. Cool. Awesome. So next up, what is the process trying to write something that holds such weight, like Aftermath, the trilogy, that tells the story of what happens right after the Return of the Jedi in this new era of Star Wars storytelling? It's a tricky thing because you want to balance it. Like one of the original ideas is like, what if? Because the interludes in the book um, are meant to give you sort of a, uh, a quick, deep dive into various areas of the galaxy. Yeah. Either characters we haven't really heard of for a while, but we know, or um, areas of the galaxy like the media or uh, the criminal underworld, like what's happening yeah. there. And one of the initial ideas was like, well, what if we did a World War Z style journal of just that kind of thing? And I was like, that's cool, but at the same time, that misses for me. Especially since this is sort of new canon and we're really breaking, you know, kind of back in with it, um, it misses for me the Star Wars vibe of like yeah. having a central story, yep. you know, a, a scrappy band of characters, you know, a small group of people changing the galaxy is kind of always how Star Wars feels to me. Yeah. So it felt like we were missing a little bit of that. So it was like, well, I wanted to be greedy and like, well, can we just do both? Like, uh-huh. we'll do like every third, fourth chapter will be yeah. one of these interludes, and then so it, it's trying to balance telling a big galactic story, but yep. also yeah. giving it a lens of a small story. And like, A New Hope is a good example because A New Hope is a very small story that gets big and then Empire sort of blows it all up Mm -hmm. and you see so much more of what's going on in Return of the Jedi Yep. Uh, so you know that's that was sort of the plan it's both intimate and galactic at the same time see one of my favorite things about Life Debt is with the interludes yeah they you see how more concise they're getting towards the story how you're seeing more recurring characters get into these so you're seeing them grow from Aftermath right not only like the character from Tatooine the lawman yeah, Cop, Cop we see Vanth, him, yeah. Cobb Vanth, yeah. we see him growing. Yep. And so it's like, it's really cool to see the progression of not only the main characters, right, but, but also side the characters. side characters. Yeah, and the cool thing about the, the interludes is they get to sort of, we get to re-loop them. So it's like, mm-hmm. sometimes we may revisit the characters, and sometimes we may revisit someone who knows those characters. So sometimes we may take those characters, like Mercurial Swift, yeah. and fold them into the main plot. Exactly. And you'll see some yep. more of that in Empire's End, too, of like that character sort of rolling into the big thing, mm-hmm. kind of feeding back into it. Oh, so there great. was always a, um, yeah. a larger design. I mean, some of them are admittedly just kind of one-off little brief yep. moments. Let's see what's happening. But mm-hmm. A lot of them kind of loop back on themselves. Yeah. So primarily you've written mostly novels. Yeah. What is it like to take these skills towards writing the comic adaptation for Marvel's uh, Force Awakens? Totally different. Because, you know, the adaptation... Like, when they hired me, my initial thought was like, well, let's do something different with it. Let's kind of take it and, like, take each chapter and maybe we'll do one issue devoted to Ray, and then we'll, mm-hmm. we'll, re, we'll go back over and we'll tell Finn's story through him telling it to her. Okay. Um, but understandably, Sturgroup was like, I don't know if you know this, but there's a movie called The Force Awakens. <laughs> yeah. And it was really good. Yeah. Uh, and I totally was on board with that. So, like, we wanted mm-hmm. a more classic. So I don't even view it so much as an adaptation, so much as a translation. We're trying to take what was on the screen and, and put and it right translate into, it into print. It's print. very yeah. different from Aftermath. Aftermath mm-hmm. is like, I had a lot of room to run. Exactly. Um, and with Force Awakens, we're trying to tell, you know, The Force Awakens very yeah. explicitly. Yeah. It's, it's like so far only the first issue's come out yeah, only as the first of issue. today's date, but it's yeah. really I, I really enjoyed the first one. Oh, thank one, you, so, thank you. Yeah. 
So lastly, we got there's been a number of growing growing number of Star Wars representation oh, in sure. the galaxy sure. with the new yeah, storytelling, new in. inclusion. Yeah. How important is that to you? And another thing is for an interlude in Life Depth, we see a transgender character. Oh, Aliota, yeah. A, and so where did the idea come to use that sort of pronoun? Was that from was that a collaboration of you and editors over at Delray? Was that more of you and the story group? No, it was um, it was my idea and um, inclusion, and then they were happy to have that. Um, and and the, the pronoun is um, one of many gender-neutral pronouns that are, um, you could use. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought it was a good way to clearly identify what was happening in that interlude, because sometimes I don't know that everyone would uh, get it. And it's good to put that kind of thing out mm-hmm. and make it be visible. Um, as for how important all of that is, it's all... Like, listen, my books are not meant to be um, social justice battlefields. No, of course uh, not. But at the same time, like, you, uh, an artist friend of mine when I was in New York Comic Con, uh, Joe Heife, I put it very well, that you go there and you see all these people and they come up and they get their book signed by you. And he's like, most of the people here don't match the characters inside the story worlds they love. Yeah. They don't get to see themselves every day in all of these story worlds. It's all predominantly, mostly white guys, kind of straight white guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, we are entering a new phase of life here where I think we need to start talking to the whole audience exactly. and not just the old audience we used to think we had mm-hmm. to talk to. Awesome. Great. Thanks so much yeah, for the man. time. Yeah, man. Thanks for having Thank me. Everybody. And everybody can tell um, what else your upcoming works are. Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, Empire's End is coming out in January, but before that, in August, I have uh, my genetically modified killer ants Jurassic Park-like story <laughs> called Invasive, um, which is both about ants and also about the anxiety and fear of the future and is a really fun, uh, crazy thriller kind of thing. So, cool. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thanks so much for cool. the time. Thanks for having me. Are you a Star Wars fan creator? Are you passionate about your work and want to share it with others? Well, my name is Thomas Lofton, and I want to help you honor the Force. Artists, filmmakers, cosplayers, writers, musicians, toy makers, or anyone with a love for the galaxy far, far away that lives to create. Contact Honor the Force on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or just by visiting our site at honortheforce.com. Contact us to see how you and your portfolio can be shared across our large network of thousands. And out of the force, we want to celebrate you. Well, hello there again, my Coffee with Kenobi friends. This is Nick Deco, your friendly force ghost guide to all things Star Wars video games. Uh, for the month of August, here in the year 2016, um, it has been a very busy few months for Star Wars video game news. As you've listened here on Coffee with Kenobi Monthly, and I haven't had the chance to really step back and review a video game in detail. Uh, and as we know, back in June, the Star Wars Lego The Force Awakens uh, came out on the consoles from anything from the PS3 to the PS4 and Xbox One, uh, everything in between. Uh, but you know what's happened since June? My kids have fell asleep in their own rooms which is, uh, as you know, something that I haven't got a lot of recently, which is sleep. So this means that I do not have to go to bed anymore at 7.30 in the evening, and I can stay up and play some video games. So I finally uh, got a chance to uh, crack open uh, The Force Awakens for Lego on my Xbox One. I picked it up last month on sale, and over the last few weeks, I finally got a chance to dive into it. So this month, I'm going to review, um, from my own point of view, a certain point of view, uh, uh, of a father of three with little time and no sleep, um, how I thought Lego uh, The Force Awakens plays into uh, your world uh, as a game to purchase, to buy, to wait to go on sale, or uh, just to sit back and um, you know watch others play or something like that. So, like your kids, perhaps. If your kids are old enough, mine are not. Uh, they are not yet. And they're too small to play with Legos, uh, which is okay for me because I get to play with my own. So, let's jump right in. Um, if you were lucky enough um, and ordered the special edition for this game, it came with lots of preloaded season uh, activity for passes, uh, new extra downloadables. Um, if you were lucky enough back in June to pre-order it for certain um, uh, consoles, I think it might have been just the Xbox One and PlayStation 4, um, but you were able to get a special uh, 
the real life version of Poe's X-Wing in a very small miniature set. Um, so uh, I actually ended up getting this small miniature set for Poe's X-Wing and I ended up purchasing the season pass on its own. Uh, since I got it on sale, I might as well save some money then purchase the season pass. So uh, it's actually kind of cool to have you know some physical Legos that go along with the video game because really, who doesn't love Legos except for my five-month-old boys? Uh, but on to the game itself. It is a lot of fun. Uh, if you've played Lego games before for any console, you'll know there's a, a specific kind of formula that it abides by. It doesn't stray too far from that. Um, so it is still really enjoyable. A, an immense cast of characters, ships, levels. Uh, the music is great. Um, it does have a lot of uh, dubbing from the movie and puts a lot of the, the same things you hear in The Force Awakens. Uh, to the video game and then there's some new dialogue that has to create as well um and the game is really focused on just the events in in the force awakens uh, it does start uh with a prologue chapter in which you're hanging out with the return of the jedi crew uh on endor uh and then you're heading up to the death star where you battle the emperor and then you blow up the second death star as lando or wedge so um that's really kind of the only part uh, that we see outside of the Force Awakens. So the rest of the game uh, does take, you know, its time trying to develop more of the worlds, uh, more of the the scenery, and kind of your your time on those different planets uh, that that happen in the movie. So it it is not like uh, the let's say original trilogy or prequel trilogy sagas uh, that uh, Lego has made for Star Wars, where you're kind of like you the games are just very vast and wide, and you're experiencing many different planets and many different kind of activities. It's really stretching out one movie for a whole game. So there's sometimes, you know, hard parts to that. Uh, but overall, the game is really enjoyable uh, and a lot of fun, I think, for all ages. Um, but a little more about the game, if you haven't had a chance to dive into it yet, um, it does offer the normal uh, kind of ground and pound uh, or smashy, smashy version of the LEGO games. Uh, you have your boss battles that, you know, you need specific uh, characters to defeat or just specific actions to, to happen. And then it adds a kind of a new level of aerial or space combat. Um, but I'll talk about that space combat a little later. Uh, but first, onto the standard protocol. Um, you do have, just like any other LEGO game, um, the things that you're doing. Uh, you're following a very linear path to the ends of the stage. You're solving specific puzzles along the way. The difference in these puzzles is that you're, you might have a different option to build something first, and then second, you have to figure out which comes which. Um, so that adds a nice little level of uh, you know, having to figure things out and not just doing one thing after the other, like so many of the Lego games before have had happen to them. And then, as always, you have uh, you have to collect the Lego studs and the Stedo meter. Um, I, I have heard that the Stedo meter is what Dan and Corey do rank Chicago Cubs players. So I'm not sure if Lego stole it from them or vice versa. But anyway, I digress. Um, but for me, you know, the best part of Lego games are the immense cast of characters. And in this game, it does not fall short. Um, I haven't looked up how many there are, but there are many. Um, from looking at the screen, at least 100-something different characters, from droids to villains to heroes and everything in between, and unlockables. Um, I do believe you can unlock J.J. Abrams and I believe Kathleen Kennedy. I haven't had a chance to do that yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but for me, I love the stages and the opportunities to play as the droids, uh, and in particular BB-8, like, because who doesn't love BB-8? Uh, but just kind of being able to roll around as him and, and do something different. Um, and being a droid takes more finesse in a game like this than it does if you're Ray or Finn or Poe or somebody that, uh, or Kylo Ren, where you can just destroy things with a lightsaber or a blaster. You really have to figure the puzzle out. Uh, and you're not able to just, you know, smash your way through a stage. So I, I do appreciate that in this kind of Lego version. Um, as somebody who's played the whole Marvel Lego series, um, you know, there's not a lot of those kind of characters in that game. So it was really nice to kind of sit back and kind of have a real puzzle aspect to this when you have the droids in there. And another aspect of the game that I thought was really interesting, um, besides the space combat, was the kind of old western shootout where you would duck and pop and pop up to shoot enemies, and you'd have some bosses to fight, and you'd have to do specific things to defeat the boss. That had, that had a nice new level, I think, to the LEGO series, and I hope they continue to have that for the next couple of games. Um, and then there's the space combat, because you can't have Star Wars without space combat. Um, it definitely has uh, a nice new level of gameplay to, you know, getting just getting off world and in, 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 in kind of a, a 360 environment. Um, but it does leave a, a little bit to be desired when it comes to the actual gameplay of the levels. Um, if you're used to any other kind of Starfighter games, it's not going to be the same for sure. Um, but, you know, 
it does have a nice little level to expand in the Star Wars universe when you get to hop in an X-Wing or the Falcon and, and just kind of fly around and blow stuff up. So with that, uh, you know, it took, it took me a little more than a week to defeat the game itself and just the, the linear pathway from going from chapter one to the end. Um, you know, and this, once you kind of get through it and you kind of figure out what do you want to replay, you need to unlock some more maybe red bricks or get the rest of the studs or, or unlock some mini fighters make, uh, in the game. It doesn't really always offer a lot of replay value to it, unless you're really interested in getting extra characters and then going through them with the extra characters to get those unlockables. So it really comes down to you uh, as somebody who wants to really experience The Force Awakens again and come at it from a different perspective. Maybe you want to get Akbar, or maybe you want to you know play as one of the Jedi from the prequels, or maybe one of the free makers from the downloadable content and see how you know they interact with the environments and things like that. Uh, so it does add that little to it, but in the end, it's not the same as a campaign that challenges you, uh, let's say, as like a shooter would or something like that. Or it doesn't offer the same level of challenges, I would say, to booting up uh, the other console game, Battlefront, and playing against people online. Because uh, you never know if something's going to change. You're going to play against better people. Um, it's never going to be the same experience. But with LEGO, it's going to be the same pretty much every time you pick up a character. Just it's going to differ a little bit here and there. Um, so that's always something, that's always something for a Lego game to be desired. But if, if you played them before, you would expect that going into it. Um, so, uh, for me, it took me a little more than a week to beat it, probably about two weeks or so, because I didn't have two hours or an hour a night to play every night, because the kids still need somebody to feed them at eight o'clock at night. Um, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, we will feed them. Uh, but there's plenty of downloadable content, much cheaper, uh, compared to Battlefront. Um, you can purchase in the season pass, you can purchase them individually, the character packs, anybody from, I mentioned the, the free makers, which is new on Disney XD this year, uh, to the prequel characters. Um, there's tons of different kind of, of, of add-ons to this game that are significantly cheaper than Battlefront, which is great. Cause if you're buying this for your kids or for yourself and you're not looking to invest a ton of money, you're not going to, you can really find this game on sale. As I did, I found it on sale for $30 last month. Um, uh, and you know, you can get a season pass for 10 and you know, um, you're spending, you know, 30 bucks less than you would if you would have bought it from day one. And that's what I would recommend. I'd definitely look for it on sale. I wouldn't, I wouldn't drop down the full price on it. I would wait for it to go on sale if you can. Um, but with that, um, I, I don't want it to just say, I did step back for a check, a, a chance and, and not play the DLC stuff yet. So I wanted to experience uh, both Battlefront and Lego Force Awakens and, and see which I enjoyed more. Uh, and for me, somebody who doesn't have a lot of time in his hands, they both offer something different. Um, Battlefront in terms of, you know, there's different challenges that come along with playing against people online. There's a different experience and a feeling that you get through really nice looking aerial combat and space combat and stormtroopers and Vader. But then there's something else relaxing of a Lego game where you can just pick up the game and play through, you know, and just play through the, through the different events of, of the level and have some fun with it and not feel like, you know, you have to be pressured to get an objective, but you can take your time and, and enjoy the music and, and the visuals and and just the, the the feeling of playing through some of these levels from The Force Awakens, which we haven't had a chance to do yet, because this is, as we know, the first game to really explore that movie, Episode 7. Um, so it is kind of nice in that regard, just to step back, even though it's in brick form, to to play the game, to play the movie, uh, and to re-experience some things outside of rewatching the movie uh, before Rogue One and Episode 8 come out. So, um, so with that, I give LEGO Force Awakens... Um, a, another solid one and a half thumbs up. It definitely has something to be desired, but overall it's a great game. It's a lot of fun for family and friends. Um, I really anticipate seeing uh, this this series continued, perhaps with Rogue One next winter, uh, before um, you know they release Episode Eight's game, which will be coming down the pipeline as well. So if you get a chance, you see it on sale, pick it up and enjoy it. And as usual, may the Force be with you. Han Solo, Rebel Soldier, Lando Calrissian, and Bespin Guard each sold separately from Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back Collection, new from Kenner. Looking? Found someone you have, I would say, hmm? Your lightsabers will make a fine addition to my collection. For our first collector's news story, it's pretty exciting. We've, um, you and I have been drooling and salivating over <laughs> Rancho Obi-Wan for, heck, as long as it's been a twinkle in our eyes. And this year, um, things have just worked out in such a way, and Coffee with Kenobi will be representing at Rancho Obi-Wan this year at the at the gala, which is on November 5th. 
Yeah, it's it's so cool. Like you mentioned, it's always become something we kind of have a you know a, a wish list of of places we like to go do things, and every year we kind of put our heads together and and kind of talk about what we want to do. And uh, this was an opportunity that you, um, we had a chance to kind of pick up, and you definitely were interested. So uh, I'm excited to be able to to be there in person for um, for, for you to kind of rub elbows with folks, and and we got to hear a great interview with. Uh, Steve Sansu about it last year and was a huge success and uh, man like you said we're just whetting our appetite to, to kind of see how that's going to be and of course you know being there and being a part of the action part of the the the, the fun and excitement uh, is really kind of beyond words it is I, I'm excited I'm going to finally get to go to Rancho and mm. I, I it stinks that you won't be able to, to join me but obviously that is something we will try to effort as as our show continues to grow and as, as time goes on. And we're going to do a lot of things, too. We're going to – we'll have interviews. We'll have some write-ups. Uh, we're, we're trying to, as you may have seen through our coverage of the Disneyland Launch Bay, which I was fortunate enough to go to yeah. a few weeks ago, um, trying to dabble more into YouTube and the videos. And as the office, as I've said, gets made here at the Coth with Kenobi <laughs> Studios – um, or what am I? The South Side Branch, East Side Branch, West something. Side, West Side, North Side, West Side Branch. Know. There you go. That makes sure. Actually, <laughs> I would be the East Side. Yeah, cool. I'm West Side. Oh. I'm riveted by what we're talking about right now. <laughs> uh, we um, we're just going to try to get in and add some more and more ways to bring you content and continue to provide an opportunity for fans to have a voice. And I'm really, really looking forward to meeting Star Wars fans and supporters of Rancho Obi Wan and. Getting to know new friends and, and reuniting with old ones. I, I do know for a fact that the chicken horse is going to be there. Ooh, very cool. Yeah, very cool. cool. Huh? So, yeah. so we'll say hi to him and and chat with him and on and on. We'll have more about the Ranch Open One fundraiser as we get closer to the date of November the 5th. Dan, for our next Collector's News, we like to talk about kind of things we've kind of seen around locally for us uh maybe some of the things we talked about getting or uh kind of a twinkle in our eye like we've said before um you know it, it comes to light too it as much as i've been out to the stores and gotten other items i do sneak through the toy aisle uh, with my kids of course right and because uh, they want to go down there so bad and, and check out stuff and uh, i'll just happen to you know pile up pile around with them and kind of see what's sure. out you're, you're giving man I, I am i have to do I, you know gotta do what i gotta do and of course, you know, it seems to me, and this is just my area where we're at, there's a lack of Star Wars items that are either freshly um, put out or um, maintained uh, as far as a stock. But, you know, maybe it's the, I don't know, lack of, of such items that kind of gives me a kind of a down, down spot about as far as, you know, seeing new stuff. And, and I, I know obviously they're, the marketing for Star Wars Rebels. Uh, Arm Star Star Wars Rogue One is is coming up, uh, of course. Force Friday we talked about is coming up September thirtieth, and you know I'm, I'm wondering if this is similar for you. It's kind of the same feelings. Well, yes and no. I mean, something funny that inspired even bringing this up on the show was earlier in the day. I I happened to be at, at Walmart looking picking up some stuff for the house, and I walked by this end cap on this aisle. And I saw this container that Glad has of Star Wars, basically Tupperware from The Force Awakens. Huh. And dude, I actually said out loud, whoa. Like, I saw a Tupperware, Glad Tupperware disposable <laughs> over, and I yelled out, whoa. Like, I, I've seen a lot of amazing things. I've never yelled out that. So that just shows me, I don't know, that I, that I need more therapy? I don't know. <laughs> I was just very excited about the little things. That's why... One of the reasons I like collecting Star Wars so much is there are so many unique items. So I, I do agree with you. There's certainly a, a severe, severe lack of three and three quarter inch action figures still looking for my Han Solo, The Force Awakens. Have not found that three and three quarter inch figure anywhere. That's definitely at the top of my list. And every time I go to Target or Walmart or Toys R Us or wherever, that's what I look for. Mm. So I'm not able to find that. But. There are lots of other little fun things too, like what I mentioned and Disney Infinity. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, unfortunately we reported on this a while back about uh, Infinity being discontinued, um, and we got great enjoyment out of that. But um, what's interesting now is you can go back out, and there's quite a few 
uh, figurines, uh, game pieces to you can if you're interested in collecting them uh, for five dollars uh, in our yeah, local, Walmart, lo- locally. Yeah, yeah. and um, like I, I, I kept to walk by the aisle um, a little while ago, and I saw quite a few Kanans and uh, Kylo Ren's, Darth Darth Vader's, Darth Mauls. Um, so there's quite a few out there uh, locally for me, and I, I was like, like you said, they're I think they're a unique piece. When I remember reporting on those when they first were announced, uh, and how excited they were because the you know the gameplay and whatnot. And so if you're looking to you know stock up on a fun collectible, that's you can kind of fill in for you know, a desk piece, or, or if you want to yeah. you know fill in your gap of collection as as far as still playing that game, I'd say head out and grab those as as kind of the low price deal. When I, when I saw in Walmart that they were only five bucks because they're more expensive at other of the places that yeah. we mentioned, um, I grabbed Boba Fett because I didn't have him. Yeah. And I finally grabbed Obi Wan Kenobi, which mediocre Jedi will be relieved to hear because he could not believe <laughs> that I didn't have Obi Wan, and I couldn't believe it either, to be honest. And so now I've I've got them all, and I'm pretty pumped. I'm almost tempted to get an extra one or two just to have them, but that's that therapy that I need, as we were talking about before. Yeah, it's interesting too because I did walk past and I thought, oh, this would be a kind of cool thing to have at work, you know. Yeah. Uh, I saw a little a desk piece that just, I've got a um, Funko Pop at work and it'd be kind of cool to have like a, you know, a Yoda. Or, I've got Yoda, but I, I guess I could, I don't, I don't hate to grab, grab them for my kids, but, you know, I have an extra Kylo Ren to have them kind of gluing in next to uh, my desk and whatnot at work and show off my fandom. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that these are kind of seeing, um, an end in sight there as far as like going on sale and what making room for new stuff but you know it is what it is and so uh, if you're interested in that check them out for our third collector's news story we just wanted to mention really briefly that we are now Twitter verified and that's really really exciting and thank you so much to our Coffee with Kenobi family for helping to come, make that come to fruition it's it's pretty cool really really a nice honor and we, we really uh, appreciate it so much yeah, Dan, it's great to have that recognition, and, and we are glad to really have the support from our family and just be able to extend the voice, to extend the welcome uh, for fans out there looking to interact with us. And um, it's great to be able to talk about Star Wars. <laughs> uh, it's a great time to be a Star Wars fan. There you go. There you go. You know, Dan, it's not every day that we get to interact with big stars and whatnot, but I think it's fun to be able to have a little piece of fandom here and there. And uh, as far as I go, I'm, and I'm not a huge collector like I mentioned before, uh, top Star Wars card trader gives me the chance to be able to collect, you know, interesting items as far as uh, the Star Wars Force Awakens, uh, Star Wars Rebels and whatnot. The card trader app allows me to kind of get fun things. And recently uh, I was happy enough to get uh, the the autograph of John Boyega and uh, Daisy Ridley uh, on collectible cards, digital cards, uh, and be able to trade those and, and have fun kind of collecting those and getting in on the action. Yeah, I was really envious when I saw that you got those mm. signature cards for Daisy Ridley and John Boyega. Really, really great. Of course, the Star Wars Digital Card Trader collecting app from Tops can be downloaded for free from iTunes or Google Play. And what I like so much about it is that you can download cards of all the images you mentioned before, plus the original trilogy. Everything that I love about Star Wars is on here. I can learn more about the characters and see their names, especially the newer characters from The Force Awakens that aren't necessarily household names to this point in our Star Wars fandom. So it's just a great way to share your fandom and collect with people from all over the world, quite honestly. yeah, It's, it's a fantastic app. It's so much fun to do. Corey and I have so much fun with it. If you want to follow us, we're at Dan Z C W K and what's yours? Corey C W K. And what's fun too is Dan, it's free. Uh you get daily credits, um, and you can like kind of go out and get free credits and whatnot and be able to purchase packs and open them and it's just like you're opening the, the you know, regular packs that are just all digital. But uh it's fun mm-hmm. too, like you mentioned, you can trade with folks uh, all over the world and be able to interact with them and have a good time with that. So I uh, definitely check it out uh for your, your iPhone or your iPad. The Star Wars digital card trading collecting app from Tops. These are the cards you're looking for. This is James Floyd. I write for StarWars.com, ClubJ.net, and BigShinyRobot.com. And you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z and Corey Club. This is the podcast you're looking for. Luke, you're going to find that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. I must be allowed to speak. 
You've taken your first step into a larger world. Our topic for show number 57 is Bloodline and Life Debt. The two most recent novels from Delroy have been incredibly well received, and we are here to look at why these two books are not only important to Star Wars, but also to literature and popular culture. Joining us on this topic is James Floyd of StarWars.com, Big Shiny Robot, and Club Jade. James has been writing about and discussing Star Wars for many years and also has an amazing initiative he's been championing in 2016. We are excited and thrilled to share a cup of coffee with him. Welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, James. Hi, Dan. Hi, Corey. How's it going? It's going great, man. We uh, we were just talking before this started, and we have, of course, been talking on Twitter forever and briefly got to chat in Anaheim. So this is a great time to chat with you, and you're so incredibly involved with Star Wars and literature anyway for StarWars.com. So this will be a, a great time to have you on. And how are things going for you so far in the Star Wars fandom in the past few weeks? Oh, things have been great. The past couple of weeks, I uh, just last month went to London for Star Wars Celebration Europe, and then right after that hit up uh, San Diego Comic-Con. So I kind of had back-to-back uh, conventions, left me pretty drained, but now I am back in the swing of things, and I'm raring to talk about stuff. Wow. Did you find a lot of um, cross-pollination between the two conventions as far as seeing the same people, or is it very much kind of different? Um, there were a handful of people that uh, were at both conventions. Most of them, um, you know, people associated with Lucasfilm or different artists or you know, people that are, are more on the professional side. But there were also a couple fans. I remember running into a guy um, at Comic-Con who was wearing a Celebration Europe shirt. And I said, hey, that's a cool shirt. I was there. <laughs> and then he sheepishly said, well, actually, my wife was there and got it for me. <laughs> <laughs> How cool, though. What, I mean, you're talking about going all over the world for Star Wars, which is what Star Wars seems to bring out in people. It also brings out great discussion. So as I mentioned at the top of this interview, we're going to share a couple of emails from listeners, and we're going to see where the conversation goes. For Because for those of you listening who are not aware, and, and I'm pretty reasonably sure that most of you are, James has an excellent column that he writes for StarWars.com, and he talks with authors of recent Star Wars books and shares kind of their insights into the making of these books. So let's look at this. Uh, we're going to look at Bloodline first. And here's the email. This is from Stephen Kent of the show Beltway Banthas. And he says, Bloodline by Claudia Gray is without a doubt the finest addition to the canon since The Force Awakens. One of my favorite aspects of the book is that Bloodline paints a picture of Leia's political career after Return of the Jedi, and successfully draws on contemporary political conversations for the story. We see a new republic torn apart by a partisanship, a very clear and poisonous divide between small and big government idealists. Neither side trusts the intentions of the other, and senators have no relationships with members of the opposition. Claudia Gray makes the story read as very familiar, without tampering with Star Wars as its own unique universe. A great example is with a centrist senator who collects imperial relics. It deeply offends Leia when she sees them. The argument that plays out is almost exactly like what happened nationally in South Carolina regarding the Confederate flag last year. That makes sense for Star Wars to take on in the context of life after the Empire. So a a great start. Thank you, Stephen, for sending that in to us. Uh, A lot of things here, gentlemen, to talk about, and we have to talk about the political aspects of Bloodline. So, James, to you, why is politics so inescapable in the Star Wars universe? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we have in the Star Wars universe, especially, um, you know, in the character of Leia, we have a politician so that this is important to her character of and, and the circles she moves in. And then when we go back to the prequels, we see that a lot of the main characters are involved in politics, whether they are Jedi being caught up in the galactic politics, whether they want to be or not, or, you know, actual politicians. We have senators, we have um, the chancellor position and so i you know this the state of affairs in star wars is often set by the politics and that you know goes whether it's the republic or it moves on to the empire that uh, you know what are the rebels rebelling against it's a, a system that they don't like and that's a political system that they don't like and, and, and it's that the cl- go ahead Corey. well i was going to mention too it's it's interesting too that you know uh, just as a, a various reader of, of novels and such and and in Star Wars itself, it's 
the political nature of it too is, is difficult to kind of wrap the general audience around too. It, to me, it's it, I'm not a political person by nature, but I think it's more of um, a little dry uh, topic for me. Um, I don't necessarily like to pick up a lot of stuff, but this I think the book as a whole was really well put together, laid out really written really well for you know general reader to read it or those looking to get into more of political nature of uh, Star Wars, like you said that 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 early. Um, prequel feeling uh, of you know the fractions kind of building up and whatnot, and of course, uh, Leia is written uh, very well uh, by the author to kind of bring out those aspirations. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that uh, you know bringing out Leia and her aspirations, and then but also seeing how she fits into the, the larger whole. Um, works out well, and I think what balances it well is that it's not all politics. That that she, you know she goes on these side missions mm-hmm. where there's lots of action, and then there are um, other characters in the story that are not politicians. That you know we have a a, a pilot, we have uh, Leia's sort of assistant slash bodyguard slash personal pilot. Um, so we, we have other characters doing other things as well. So it's not just you know sitting around in committee <laughs> right they don't have time to discuss this invasion of the committee that sounds similar <laughs> familiar. Um, here's the thing too about this book that's unique and how do we pronounce um the senator uh, castorfo castorfo you know how, is this person <laughs> ransom 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 yeah. castorfo i i yeah, my I mean, mind says casterfo so if i say casterfo later on just know it's supposed to be castorfo this is something that i ask the author in the in the interview Right, mm-hmm. exactly. That's that's why I that's why I thought when you were, were chatting. So that that does help. And I mean, it's again, Star Wars names are not necessarily natural to always pronounce. So so Castor, we'll, we'll go with that um, because it's official. But he has a very unique dynamic with Leia that I think really drives the book and creates this incredible tension that makes the ending so powerful. Uh, he's the kind of character, James. I think that I hope to see more of in Star Wars. What do you think he adds to this universe? Uh, he adds a tremendous amount of just being a character that that he is complex. He's not just a one-dimensional, you know, cardboard villain that you start off at the beginning thinking, "Oh, I'm going to hate this guy," because you know he collects imperial relics and stuff and displays them in his, in his Senate office. And then by the end of the book, you know, you've done a complete 180. You're like rooting for him and and you know really don't want things to happen to him even though he ends up still being you know the opposition to leia that that uh you know you can see the tension in him you can see the tension in her that they get along on a personal level but they're on opposite ends of the political spectrum and you know when he goes in to score points for his side you know it puts leia out and then eventually it comes around to bite him as well Absolutely. There's and there's it's kind of neat how it's really kind of haunting. Steven's email really had me looking at things even more differently in that it really I don't of course like Corey said, we're not a political show by any stretch of the imagination, but it's pretty haunting to be honest, how this kind of matches some of the political things going on in uh, the real world, shall we say. Although that sometimes the real world seems more fictional than Star Wars, to be honest. Um, I think that, you know, there's certainly a lot of politics that you can put into from the real world into this, but at the same time, like when I read it, I didn't necessarily pull any specific incidents in, like like you mentioned before, with uh, the the imperial relics, you know, maybe mirroring the the South Carolina and the Confederate flag. Um, going back for a second, I just re looked at yeah. my notes from um, interviewing Claudia Gray. It's the, the emphasis is on the first syllable. It's Casterfo. I Cast- no, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't know, even know how to really say it that way, honestly. <laughs> Caster. Um, but that, I mean, anytime that you set up a system, the outcome of that system is going to be influenced by the institutions you set up. And so just like in the, in the United States and many other types of uh, dem- democracies, when you set up a kind of 50% plus one type electoral system you're going to end up pretty much with two parties that that that's just if you have to win at least half you're going to try and make the biggest block you can and so it's going to kind of make a two-party state and i think that's how the new republic has ended up as well with the centrist and populists 
and you know there's some interesting dynamic there of uh, you know they both have good points for for their platforms, but uh, you know they again don't really talk to each other or you know, reach out to each other very much, and I think that you know leads to the problems that the New Republic faces, and that's something that maybe we do see parallels with you know here on Earth with in the United States with the the increased partisanship that uh, people seem to think has been happening recently. It's very true. Well said. Yeah, well said. And and it's, you know, of course, this book revolves around Leia um, and her, her figure and her kind of upbringing through politics and whatnot. We kind of get to see how she uh, moves with in and out uh, her, her political uh, career. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, like, like the, the title says, this is Bloodline, so it's, it has a lot to do with where she comes from as well. Uh, what what did the book itself uh, do for Leia as a character, in, in your opinion? That's a good question. I think it, it brought her forward. Um, we don't often get books that are told from Leia's point of view, so making her the main character of it, I think, really brings her forward. It gets into her brain, uh, into her heart, in a way that we really hadn't seen before. Um, and, you know, she is part of, you know, the big three of, of our main characters, but oftentimes, you know, many of the other books and stories will focus on Luke or Han and Leia kind of takes a, a side character role. And here she's the main focus. And here you get to see her, um, you know, kicking butt in the political world, kicking butt in, you know, the world of, of, being kind of a secret agent a little bit, you know, when she goes to uh, hmm. on a mission um, to to find out what the the, the Twi'leks were complaining about, um, and you know, again, you know, here she has kind of her little squad of uh, people that she leads, and you know, she's now got to contend with bringing a member of the political opposition with her on some of these missions, and so it's like, how do I balance being the senator? And, and it's kind of interesting that we see here that, you know, in, in the original trilogy, we see her as the princess primarily and a leader of a rebellion. And that's a very different role than we have her here where she's a senator in a fully fleshed out government. And then finally, you know, we see things moving towards where she's going to be in The Force Awakens, which is a general of a resistance movement again. I, I absolutely love. I mean, this is not again. This is not really our book report because there've been plenty of reviews written about this book, and and they've all been really excellent and insightful in their own unique way. But this is something where at the end, when she's rescued by Han, who's really not that present in the novel, his presence is certainly felt. But it's much more about the supporting cast that Leia has. You mentioned James at the top of the show, and we see a little bit of crossover with these characters as well. But how do they add to? St- the Star Wars kind of tapestry and kind of bring in some diversity. Um, the the side characters uh, like Greer and Joff, um, I think one of the things that they bring in is a different point of view that they're not from the same generation as Leia, and so they didn't grow up with the Empire. I think they they make a point of Joff being completely, you know, born after the Empire's destruction, and so he longs for for the adventure as a pilot that he wants to be in battles and such. And, you know, being a pilot in the new Republic so far hasn't brought him that um, because he grew up in a time after everything had settled. Um, And so I think, you know, seeing things from a different generation's point of view is is a great thing. Um, And we get to see kind of mirrors fandom too, really, when you think about original trilogy fans versus the force awakens fans. Oh, true. I Hmm. hadn't even thought of that, but yeah, that, that we also have, you know, Corsella who, is introduced here and we see briefly in um, the force awakens and, and plays a little bit more of a role in the force awakens novelization. And so we get to see her kind of in, as a younger version of her, you know, just starting to get involved in uh, politics. And it's interesting that we see, um, you know, core and you realize that she's only a teenager. And then you think back and it's like, Leia was only a teenager when everything was going down in a new hope that she was a senator and a spy and a leader of the Rebel Alliance, and, you know, she's not even 20, and that's pretty amazing when you think about it. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. We, we let, bef- Go ahead. Oh, you, you have something to comment on? Or? 
No, I, I want to jump into something about Vader, but sure. I, I think I know where you're going, and I, and I feel the force in you. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, along with like this political nature stuff, I, you know, as I was kind of reading up some, on some of the reviews and such uh, for the book, I, I did come across Star Wars uh, had, or I guess Lucasfilm had released some kind of uh, some marketing items and such for Bloodline, and it kind of took on like a political nature of like a, a political ad of a campaign of some sort. Uh, kind of bashing Princess Leia and such and telling she was a liar and a, a thief and all those kinds of things. And I thought it was an interesting take uh, on how to market the book and kind of get behind, like, like if we talked about the political nature of things. And I think that's it's, it's kind of interesting, the marketing, how the marketing comes into that. And I'm just curious what you guys, had, if you'd seen those um, videos or uh, had, th- had any thoughts on those. Well, I'll dive in. Um, I thought their their marketing campaign of of you know hyping up the political nature of the book in this um, election year in the United States hmm. was a, a good idea and you know it played into it and then immediately you know having these posters saying you know vote Leia and yeah. then showing the reverse side of it saying you know with the uh, liar or traitor um, spray painted across it kind of it, it makes you kind of think and um, and especially when it said liar and it had Vader's mask um, it, that, that you know it's like we we see Leia as the hero because you know we're watching this as a you know and from outside the story but uh, you know so we know who the heroes are and who the villains are but you know within the universe you know there are people that believe different things and so it, it makes you think for a second like hey how is she a liar that, that, you know, if the opposition paints her as a liar and then who are these people that are, you know, after her, you know, gunning for her politically. And I believe too, that the, the impact that see the pivotal scene, the climax really of the entire novel is where everyone discovers, you know, the, the lineage of the Skywalkers and how Leia is the daughter of Darth Vader. That scene is, is maybe one of the more powerful examples of pathos in all of Star Wars, just the way it was handled by Claudia Gray and sort of the the aftermath of that. Oh, nice little tie into our next book too, huh? Uh, so <laughs> I so James, mean. talk about for us kind of what, what that scene means for Star Wars. I think it is a really pivotal um, scene because I, I think it you know it shows not only the breakdown in the Senate of the you know of the New Republic, that uh, we have one of the biggest heroes of our story, and one of the you know their key candidate for the position of first senator, you know, being taken down by this revelation, and you know it's it's a bombshell that you know, ripples across the whole galaxy. That that you know everything everybody knew about Leia is now turned on its head. Um. And it, you know, it sinks her career and it, you know, puts her party in this really awkward spot of we've been pushing for this candidate that was otherwise perfect because, you know, who's going to besmirch the person that we're running who is, you know, a hero of the rebellion who lost her planet, um, you know, who is personally tortured by Darth Vader. Um, and now it's like, oh, hey, she's Vader's daughter and – Nobody knew it, not even her friends. That that really only Luke and Han were the only ones that knew. And 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 not only do we see it from a galaxy wide stance, that we see it on personal levels. That you know, Leia realizes, oh crap! Now I have to tell Ben. I, we were trying to to keep this uh, secret from Ben until he was old enough, until it was the right time. And now it's out there for everybody. We need to. She needs to record a message for him. And then in the meantime, uh, you know, Corsella says, you know what? I'm out of here. And so, you know, when, when her, her staff defects from her, that that's, you know, powerful that, that, you know, and, and she learns that only two senators, you know, managed to try and salvage the situation and speak up on her behalf in the Senate after that, that it's like, yeah, she is stripped down to, to nothing. And, um, and it also, you know, the, the new Republic is, you know, right here having a, a big crisis and you know as it plays out uh you know we see that this could be the uh the end of a strong new republic very much so and when she actually comes out and says hey this is all the things that i have lost do you think that you are feel betrayed think about how i felt it is very very powerful and probably in the interest of time i want to move on to the next email which 
ties in very nicely and transitions between these two books. And it's from Feel the Force Mike on Twitter, and he writes, Both of these novels illustrate the relationship, specifically the understanding of responsibility and duty between Han and Leia. In each story, both are bound by doing what is right, Han to Chewie and Leia to the New Republic slash Resistance, and are forced to make sacrifices in their marriage. It could easily cause tension between them, but instead they respect the other's choices, knowing that the burden they carry is what makes the other who they are. No resentment between them, only love and respect. A beautiful transition. Thanks again, Mike, for sending that in. Between these two books, Life Debt uh, does bring a lot of kind of more nuance to the the Han Leia relationship. And between both of these, we really haven't seen the kind of tension you would expect, expect but, but a lot of incredible amounts of understanding. Yeah, well, I will say that I'm not done with Life Debt yet, unfortunately. I'm about halfway through. I, you know, because of the book coming out right before Celebration Europe, I got a little bit behind with all the stuff. Um, but from what I've seen, uh, from what I've read, uh, yeah, that I think that, uh, you know, people might expect the sort of tension that was in their relationship before they were married, that, you know, the little sniping at each other, but at the, you know, by the time we see them in The Force Awakens, that there's there's just genuine love and understanding there, that they, they know that, you know, they don't have a perfect marriage, but that they're there for each other at the end of the day. Um, and it's interesting to see that in Life Debt and in Bloodline, that, you know, in Bloodline, you know, they, they're communicating even though they're not anywhere near each other. And then in um, Life Debt, that they realize that, you know, you have your field that you've got to be responsible for. I've got my fields that I've got to be responsible for. And, you know, we'll just try and, you know, make time for ourselves when we can and when, you know, our responsibilities aren't pulling us in 10 million directions. Oh, I guess I should turn on my microphone. And of course we've got this incredible new, new cast that has been put in and, and at life that takes the world of aftermath that it was, it was an excellent book, but certainly received in, in very different ways. And I, I know that, you're kind of going through it uh, for the first time for a very good reason. We all wish we had the same reason you did for not doing it. But what do you think so far of the of the inner workings of the novel and, and sort of how how the author Chuck Wendig is taking these characters and and melding them so beautifully into the Star Wars universe that we already know so well? Um, I think with with aftermath moving into life debt that yeah the aftermath kind of introduces the characters and they're on their own mission cohesively and then this brings them into the larger world um, as they're now sent out on you know missions and they're they, they've now formed their team and they're they're still having you know uh, sorting out how they they feel about each other. Um, I, I really like Singer. Uh, one of my favorite moments with him was um, just kind of an aside that that uh, you know he he goes back to the bar and kind of wakes up at the bar and um, Jas finds him there, and then at the end they just kind of look over and there's the the two guys that are also you know face down in the bar because Singer you know beat the crap out of him for being rude to him and and you know insulting him and and it's just very much this a little aside of like oh yeah. Those guys, yeah, they were rude. Um, but I think that that it definitely kind of ups the game and ups the scale as they're you know trying to, to track down what happened uh, to Han Solo. And um, I think with with Wendig's style, I like the interludes that he puts in that shows what's going on around the universe or around the galaxy. That uh, you know lets you know that there's a, a bigger picture out there, and you know. For some people, life has changed dramatically, and for other people, you know, life goes up, life goes down, or maybe it has stayed the same. Yeah, it's, again, we spoke about this earlier about the diversity uh, of kind of where these books kind of bring us uh, as far as a culture and whatnot. And I mean, if you have, have some thoughts on diversity in Star Wars and, and, and used in Life Debt, or maybe even. Um, Bloodline, what are some of the things that uh, brought us closer to where we want to be as a culture? I think uh, a lot of it comes down to having people that, you know, look like and represent 
all of humanity um, that you know we have race Sloan being a female of color uh, working within the empire and you know that's something that we really hadn't seen before that you know was introduced in a new dawn and we've seen her progress as a character through all these books because you know she's such a good character to keep using um, and I and I think that uh, you know uh, Chuck Wendig, you know, gave props to John Jackson Miller for introducing that character, and then we have, you know, lots of other characters that we um, we have Singer, we have uh, Mr. Bones and Nora mm-hmm. and uh, Temin, um, and we just see different points of view, and we see that people, you know, get along. That 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 you know, some of the the issues that we have here on our world don't exist in the Star Wars world. That that. Uh, because you know they've just learned to say, "Hey, you know what? We're all sentient beings, and you know whether we have this skin color or that skin color, or these biological bits or those biological bits, or we're attracted to these people or those people, you know, that doesn't really matter. You're, what what matters is you know who you are inside." Absolutely, and and that's something that's so very important for us, which is why, again, why we go to the well of Star Wars so often because. It often mirrors life and helps us to look at our lives and our culture in a way that I think provides education and can bring open communication if people are are willing to listen to that. And pretty much most of the time it seems to be working. And life that I think, as we've been saying, has taken a big step in diversity because often we hear that there's diversity in Star Wars. And I find that until recently to be a bit of a stretch because I don't think different alien species represent true authentic diversity in our world and our culture. So Chuck Wendig is one of the authors that gets it. We've been seeing a lot more of that incorporated into Star Wars over the past few years and it's been really, really great. And I think the thing I like the most about James, this James so far is that when Wendig puts in examples of diversity in characters, as you said, that are attracted to either the same sex or different sex, it really doesn't seem to make a difference in how these characters are as far as it being a gimmick or some sort of a an inauthentic way to create controversy. It actually is like a legitimate real character that adds layers to this to the story and you really can't imagine the characters being any differently. I'm kind of rambling, but does that make sense? No, that that totally makes sense. I think that it, it's trying to simply just portray people as they are, rather than trying to fit, you know, any sort of preconceived stereotype about um, sexual orientation or about color or whatnot. Um, I think your point about you know just because there's aliens in it makes it diverse, and and you're not buying into that. I think that is is a great point. Um, that you know, people think you know Star Wars is diverse, and and you know, certainly. At the time that the original movies came out, we're like, oh yeah, it's diverse because we have Lando and we have Admiral Ackbar and you know we have Leia and and then but that's kind of still just a you know 1970s 1980s mindset and now we need to you know be a, a 21st century mindset about that and that is you know making sure everybody is included and making sure everybody you know has a chance to to see themselves in Star Wars. Absolutely. There's 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 so many things to both of these books, and um, I guess putting them both in the one show can be sort of daunting, but having you on to discuss it, James, is exactly the way to go because we appreciate your knowledge and the way you look at the Star Wars universe, and right on, brother. Right on. <laughs> but before we let you go, though, of course we have our five questions that we need to ask you, but I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about – your initiative for wearing a Star Wars t-shirt every day. Well, it's not just a Star Wars t-shirt, but uh, Wear Star Wars Every Day is a uh, fundraising campaign that I started at the beginning of the year. Uh, Today, August 9th, uh, when we're recording this episode, is day 222. Um, What I'm doing is wearing a different Star Wars apparel item every day um, for as long as I can. I hope to go out the entire year. And I've been doing it with stuff that I owned and stuff that has been 
uh, lent to me by by friends, by other Star Wars fans, and then also stuff that's been donated to me. So I've worn you know lots of different T-shirts and other uh, types of shirts, but also hats. I've worn a belt. I've worn a skirt. Um, I, I had one week of nothing but her universe tops. Um, I've I've worn also for one week I think just baby onesies that uh, my, my daughter <laughs> lent me. Um, I, those just fit on my head. So most of the most of the time, you know, I'll wear it and I, I take a picture of me with the uh, the, the item on um, and post it up on my uh, Wear Star Wars Every Day Facebook page and post it up on Twitter with the hashtag Wear Star Wars Every Day. And what I'm doing is um, for each day that I wear a new item. Um, I'm raising money for a charity organization. It's a grassroots nonprofit called Collateral Repair Project. They are a small organization uh, based in Amman, Jordan, and they provide assistance and education and community support to uh, refugees that are you know, mostly fleeing from Iraq and from Syria, um, ending up in Jordan, which uh, right now I think like one-ninth of Jordan's population is foreign-born. Um, that they're coming in, not only you know are refugees living in refugee camps, but many of them you know just end up living in the cities, and so they don't have any sort of network to connect them to anyone, um, and they're not allowed to work. And so it's like they uh, collateral repair project helps them with you know first emergency things like just food assistance or heating oil assistance um, during the winter, you know getting them mattresses, but also then provides a community center for them where they can take. Uh, English classes or computer classes, they can take yoga um, and other things to help them uh, deal with post-traumatic stress disorder that a lot of you know, refugees suffer from because they've come from very violent situations. Um, they also you know, provide after-school programs for, for children. Uh, they, I, I believe about one-third of all the refugees that are coming into Jordan are under the age of 18. They, they run two Girl Scout troops. They help um, refugee children be able to uh, get school supplies. Um, so they do a lot of good and, you know, they're just a small organization. Um, but I, I had heard about them through a cousin of mine who had uh, been to Jordan as, as part of her work for the, with the Red Cross. And so I thought, hey, this is something that I can get involved in. Let's not make this project about me um, wearing different Star Wars things. And while that would be cool, let's make it a, a fundraiser to, to help um, and do some real good in the world. And you know, I picked a uh, collateral repair project at a time when you know, refugees were a, a big issue in the news, um, especially between you know different sides in the political discussion. And you know, what well, right now that kind of the, the plight of refugees is getting a little left out, you know, because now we have you know the Olympics on and we have the presidential election cycle going on, but there's still a lot of need there. Um, and so, yeah, I've been doing it. Uh, people have uh, made just one-time donations on a GoFundMe that I have. Uh, that is at uh, GoFundMe.com/slash Wear Star Wars 2016. Um, people can also sign up to make a daily pledge. So each day that I keep wearing a new Star Wars item that is right now $4.65 raised uh, by the people who have made pledges. And I'm having a kind of a, a special thing going on uh, this month um, with uh, some prize giveaways, some swag that I picked up at uh, Comic-Con and, and Celebration Europe, including an advanced copy of Ahsoka. Um, so if anyone donates in the month of August, they, uh, if you donate $25 or more, uh, you are put in the prize drawing for that Ahsoka uh, advanced galley. Um, that's pretty much the, the, the project. Uh, you know, I've, I've gotten to wear some, uh, you know, costumes as well. I had my Jedi robes and, I, and a friend of mine let me his biker scout armor. So, and, you know, people have been very responsive, uh, sending me, you know, clothes. Uh, somebody at Celebration Europe, uh, brought me a shirt that I wore for that day. Um, and, and other people have brought me all kinds of different stuff. And, and so I'm hoping to get all the way through the year when it gets to the end of the year, I don't know if I'll keep going or whatnot. Um, but I'm really appreciative to uh, you guys letting me talk about this and to uh, everybody who's just supported me, whether you know by donating uh, to the cause or by lending me um, different things or um, even just liking and sharing the, the posts on Facebook and on Twitter. That's that's wonderful. Wow, that's incredible a uh, movement you got going on there and appreciate you coming on and talking about it. And I'm curious to know too. 
I'm not a huge Star Wars collector myself, but I do have a pair of Star Wars socks, which is most the most craziest thing I think I have as, as far as Star Wars apparel. But um, I'm curious to know, too, like you mentioned, you had some folks and friends and kind of following you and, and uh, letting you borrow some items. What's the craziest thing you've worn so far? Besides the um, onesies, you mean? Yeah, besides, besides the onesies. Besides the that's, that's pretty up there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. The, the craziest one, I mean, just recently I wore a belt that on the buckle it had Chewbacca riding a bicycle wearing a messenger bag. Um, and that was just kind of crazy because it's like... It's canon, too. <laughs> it's totally can't yeah um, i i found that uh you know wearing uh some of the her universe tops that that uh you know going sleeveless or having kind of a caplet sleeve is not something i'm used to like having my armpit just out there <laughs> so that just felt a little different um certainly i loved getting uh kitted up in the biker scout armor that was a lot of fun mm-hmm. um and the the day i wore the um her universe lightsaber skirt uh, was actually when I was in uh, Columbus for uh, their Stonewall uh, Columbus Pride Parade, and I wore that in the parade to, to celebrate a friend who was uh, getting married the next week to kind of for her bachelorette party to uh, you know show the love for her, and and she really really appreciated that. So, wow, I I have even more respect for you than I already had because, and I already had a lot because. This is an amazing thing, and I, I, I don't know why I thought it was only a Star Wars T-shirt. So I apologize for that. And my goodness, it's it's really incredible. How did you even come up with this idea? Well, uh, the idea came up <laughs> up with I uh, I can speak English. Um, last year, I was looking at like all the Star Wars you know clothing I had that you know it's mostly shirts and a couple hats and you know, mm-hmm. a couple other random items. And I thought, what if I, you know, just started wearing a different one every day? How far could I get? And, you know, I kind of looked at it and maybe said, well, maybe two or three months or something. I was like, well, what if I could try and go an entire year, you know, if I got, you know, friends to help me out? Because, you know, I got, you know, know some some other Star Wars fans that also have Star Wars wear. And then, and then, and then it kind of just snowballed from there. It was like, well, why make this about me? Let's, you know, make it a, a force for good. Um, and so that, that's kind of where it came from. And, you know, so most of the clothes I've been wearing have been, you know, lent from other people that, uh, you know, I've had a one friend in the 501st who's probably donated at least three weeks worth of clothes. And I haven't even gotten through it all because I like to space it out, everybody's stuff. And other people have, you know, donated, you know, like 10, 15 shirts at a time. Um, you know, th- those are people who are local to me, but then, you know, other people will have shipped me uh, stuff from where they are, um, either stuff that they are donating and then all this stuff that's been donated. Um, I, I plan to uh, probably put that all up on eBay that, to raise more money for collateral repair project as well. And some of that stuff is pretty exclusive, like some, you know, celebration uh, wear from past celebrations. So, you know, be on the lookout for some uh, cool stuff that you could get your hands on and have the money go to a good cause. Oh, absolutely. And we will definitely put links to all of this in our show notes so people can get in and, and help out this amazingly important cause. And as a, a side I, I note, think I've, I think I've worn some coffee with Kenobi wear even a couple you times. Have. <laughs> you have. I was just going to say that we appreciate that so much. That was very, well, very, very cool. Yeah. I, I like showing off uh, and, and supporting the, the fan um, side of Star Wars that, you know, whether it be podcasts or fan clubs or costume clubs or whatever, I, I definitely love showing that off. We just released our, our latest coffee chat with Joe Taylor, and the entire topic of that was about the giving nature and, and the charitable nature of Star Wars fandom and, and how truly inspired it can be. So, James, thank you so much for contributing to that and everything that you do, not only for for this cause, but just for fandom in general. We really appreciate it so much. Well, thank you. You bet. So before we let you go, we have to ask you our five questions that we ask every guest on Coffee with Kenobi. Are you ready, my friend? Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Your favorite Star Wars movie? My favorite Star Wars movie, I'm going to say Return of the Jedi. That's my go-to for... Oh, Baby Jawa is in the house now. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, James, your favorite Star Wars character? Favorite Star Wars character? Ooh, um, I'm gonna go with. Oh, 
Uh, Mrs. Jawa says I should say Hondo. Hondo Onaka, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> famous pirate. Um, but Good I choice. think the, the character that overall might be my favorite is Chewbacca simply because I think he's the best good guy. Interesting. Maybe we, we've never actually done an entire show based on Chewbacca, but I think the force hmm. awakens brought up actually some depth to the character, which was really, really cool. What is your favorite line of dialogue or film moment? Wow. My favorite dialogue or film moment. Um, my favorite film moment Probably at least today is when the uh, stormtrooper hits his head in a new hope. That little dunk <laughs> sound gets me. No one time. said that yet. In three yeah, years, oh, no baby one Jawa said that. laughed too. Well, there you go. <laughs> we can ask baby Jawa these questions and later too. Yeah, maybe when she learns to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, James, if you collect, uh, what is your favorite collectible that you own? My favorite collectible that I own. I'm going to say my uh, vintage Kenner – oh, it's a toss-up between the, the Greedo action figure and the Power Droid action figure that I've had them since I've been kids. Hmm. Um, and you know the, the Power Droid went with me to college, whereas you know, Greedo stayed home with my family. And, but now uh, when, when Baby Jawa goes over to visit my folks, she plays with the Greedo action figure. And you know, that, that Greedo has taken so much abuse over the years that our, our pet rabbit not off one of the antenna. I think his thumb is missing. But uh, you know, he's, he's kind of part of the family legacy. Um, Another one that a collectible I got recently that uh, is pretty cool is the uh, print from Celebration in Europe uh, called Londinium Calling uh, by Jeff Carlyle. Uh, Jeff Carlyle, you know, does these amazing um, art pieces mm-hmm. for the celebrations that often involve these giant crowd scenes, um, and he often puts in lots of uh, Star Wars characters and, but also a lot of fans. And so uh, he included me and Mrs. Jawa and Baby Jawa in that uh, print. Nice. That's outstanding. What a cool, unique collectible, too. So last one for you. What particular messages or themes about the Star Wars saga resonate or speak to you? I think the, the theme of uh, friendship uh, speaks to me that, that you know, while we are rooting for the, the, the good guys because they're on the side of good, they're also sticking out for each other. And the, and the reason we care about them is – that they are friends to each other, they're loyal to each other, that, you know, when Luke learns his friends are in danger on Cloud City, he drops everything to go help them. Um, and so I think, you know, that it speaks to the, the, the power of friendship and, I, and it, you know, it shows at the end that, you know, the friendship and love that, that people have for their uh, close ones is really important. That, you know, the, the, uh, the Empire, the, the Emperor says that, you know, your faith in your friends is your weakness and, no, it's his strength that, uh, you know, that's his love is, you know, what brings Vader back to the good side. So, you know, I think that's what really resonates with me. Well, it's well said, well said. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been great having you on and are curious to know if uh, wherever listeners can get in touch with you, if they want to ask you a question or just say hello. Uh, well, the easiest way to get in touch with me is on Twitter. Um, I'm at james jawa on twitter uh everywhere else i'm jawa james when i signed up for twitter jawa james was taken uh so i'm james jawa on twitter that's the easiest way to get a hold of me um you can read uh, my articles on starwars.com usually about uh books or sometimes events and then uh you know also i'm i write articles and post videos uh to club jade uh, which is club jade.net and as gonk on big shiny um i'll be at salt lake comic-con coming up in september so uh, you can come say hi to me i'll be on a couple panels there and you might uh, get a chance to chat with mark hamill that's right. They just announced today. Uh, Mark Hamill will right. be there. I'm, I'm sure that uh, Brian Young will probably get the uh, better chance to, to moderate the Mark Hamill panel. <laughs> I'm sure. He's probably in line right now. <laughs> he probably <laughs> is. <laughs> and rightfully so. Well, good, good deal. Yeah. James, thank you so much for having a cup of coffee with us. Uh, we yeah. look forward to chatting with you in the near future. Yeah, Dan, Corey, thank you very much for having me on the show. This is a lot of fun. More to add. Do you? Our topic for show number 58 is the latest Star Wars experiences in the Disney theme parks. What are some of the differences between Disneyland and Disney World? 
How does the franchise impact visitors throughout the parks? What are some of the collectibles we can hope for, and how do they reach each generation? Joining us for this topic is the Disney podcast WDW Today, as we feature our first ever crossover with a popular show. Be sure to send us an email or MP3 with your thoughts, comments, questions, and opinions to feedback at coffeewithkenobi.com. And who knows, your question just might be featured on the show. I like the sound of that. If you love Star Wars and love the excitement of chasing your favorite Star Wars collectibles, the Star Wars Digital Card Trader collecting app from Tops is for you. Download the free app from iTunes or Google Play and collect your favorite images from the classic 1977 Star Wars cards to Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels, The Force Awakens, and much more. Collect and trade with friends new and old through the Star Wars Digital Card Trader collecting app from Tops. These are the cards you're looking for. Chewie, get us out of here! If you would like to respond to our question of the show, have a comment, or just want to say hello, send us an email or MP3 at feedback at coffeewithkenobi.com. Or if you have a specific question or comment for either of us individually, email us at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com or Corey C at coffeewithkenobi.com or visit us at coffeewithkenobi.com and click on the contact us section or comment on one of the stories featured on the site. If you enjoy the show, please write a review in iTunes or Stitcher. You can also like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash coffee with Kenobi, as well as keep up to date at our Twitter feed at coffee with Kenobi. You can also find us on Tumblr at coffee with Kenobi.tumblr.com. If you enjoy the jazz music, the album is Eye to Eye by Steve Torok. Give the evacuation code signal. That's it for show number 57 of Coffee with Kenobi. A huge thank you to James Floyd for being our guest and analyzing Bloodline and Life Debt. Be sure to check out the links in our show notes for ways to support his wear Star Wars campaign. Thanks again for joining us and for being a part of our Coffee with Kenobi family. A special shout out to Dennis Keithley, Walt Fishin, Bradley W. Hall, Angela Souse, Mediocre Jedi, Adam Leonard, Christopher Ripley, Suara Sali, Jared Cantor, BJ Smith, Eric Struthers, Nick Deco. Aaron Harris, Mark Suter, Jesse, and Mike Audette for their contributions to our Coffee with Kenobi Patreon page. Because of all of you and your generosity, you make it possible for so many people to have a unique voice in Star Wars fandom. You can also help out our show through our Amazon.com, Fandango, Cufflinks.com, Her Universe, Zach Designs, and Steiner Sports Affiliates links on our site. Thank you for supporting Coffee with Kenobi. We cannot do any of this without all of you. Be sure to check out the other shows in our Coffee with Kenobi family. Legends Library, Rebels Reactions, Comics with Kenobi, and Lattes with Leia, which are all here on the Coffee with Kenobi feed. A big thanks to our media specialist, Lisa Dullard, our Coffee with Kenobi bloggers, Nick Deco, everyone who contributed to this show, and to all of you out there who listen to and email Coffee with Kenobi. Don't forget to send us your comments and opinions on the topic for show number 58, the latest Star Wars experiences in the Disney theme parks. This is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. There's no one here. Move along. Move along.